In computer networks, we are looking at uh, chapter number two, the physical layer. The physical layer, this is the lower most layer. If you talk about ISO OSI layer or the TCP IP, the layer which is responsible for actual bit transmission. So we are going to discuss the reference model. Whichever reference model you choose, this physical layer is important because this physical layer, it will define, it will tell you about the electrical, current, timing. There are various interfaces which we are going to talk about through which we are transferring the bits. So these bits are sent as signals over the channels. These are the bits through or the layer responsible is the physical layer. Now there can be multiple channels which we are going to discuss. So the properties of these physical channels, it can be UTP, it can be coax, it can be fiber optics. So it will determine the performance. It can be throughput, latency, error rate. Throughput is how faster or how much time the bits are coming out, latency, the delay or faster, error rate, how much is uh, dropped or how much you get. We will talk about these with definitions. So there are three kinds of transmission media. Guided or wired, we will talk about copper, coaxial cable and fiber optics. Then we will talk about the wireless, that is the terrestrial radio. So here wire we will see, the first one, guided or wired means we will have some wire. The second one, there will be no wires. And finally, the satellite. Guided transmission media. So what is the purpose of the lowest layer? Physical layer. If one zero you are sending, it should go one zero, that is bits. So transporting bits from one machine to another. So this transmission media or any channel relying on a proper physical cable or wire that you can touch, you can feel are called guided transmission media. That is source to destination bits are going and there has to be some way, the way is cable or wire. So there will be, why we are calling it as guided? Because the signal transmission, they are guided. If there is a proper wire. It is guided by that physical wire or cable. So this guided transmission media, it will be copper cable. It can be in the form of coaxial cable, the twisted pair, or it can be fiber optics. Fiber optics will use glass. We'll talk about the technology behind fiber optics. In coaxial cable and twisted pair, the central is copper cable. It's a very good conductor of the signals and the channel is very good. Bandwidth, there are various uh, say characteristics of any channel, for example bandwidth. So this is nothing but the measure of the carrying capacity of a medium. Assume it to be a pipe. So the mouth of the pipe, the bigger or, or smaller, that will decide the higher and lower bandwidth. Okay. Now this bandwidth is measured in hertz, that is kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. Why we are calling it as hertz? Because here is a very famous German physicist, Hendrik Hertz, on his name. In the honor of great Hendrik Hertz, the bandwidth, you will see hertz, uh, you know, most of the places. Hertz. Okay. So this, uh, along with bandwidth, we will be discussing other things. To transfer data from one place to another, there can be multiple ways. We have seen, you know, in our vicinity neighborhood, some wires or wireless, but persistent storage is a way, the best way and the most, uh, you know, known way. For example, you have a house. Now you are shifting to some other place. You will be transferring your house. Okay. So you will rent a truck. You will put your all belongings and then you will go to the other house. So in the, in the context of communication, the persistent storage, the common ways to transport data 
is to write them on a persistent storage or the actual storage like magnetic or solid state storage. It can be DVDs, it can be magnetic tapes. And now we are physically transferring the data on the tape and disk to the destination machine. I'll give you an idea of calculation. I'll not go to the detail. This is from the Tannenbaum book, the famous book on networking. So the, the idea is that if you want to transfer the data from one place to another to various means, for example, truck. So this is a, the Altrium tape and it can hold 30 terabytes. Now we would like to transfer say 800 terabytes. Terabytes means it will be 6400. One byte is 8 bit. It becomes 6400 terabits. Now you can convert it into petabits also 6.4 petabits. In United States, for example, anywhere you want to send some uh, say delivery, it will be in 24 hours. Now this 6.4 petabits have to be transferred, say 24 hours day. 24 hours is 24 into 60 into 60 seconds. Now divide this 6400 terabits by the seconds, you will get 70 gbps. So if you are transferring the data physically through a truck, say, that will be 70 gbps. If the if you just have to go uh, one hour, if your destination is one hour, it will be 1700 gps, unimaginable. That is transferring. Now let us uh, have a very brief calculation of cost effectiveness. For example, Altrian tape has certain cost. What will be the cost of buying it and reusing it? Let us say it is uh, say four thousand dollars. Now say one thousand dollar for shipping, buying a taking a truck, hiring a truck, and then so four thousand plus one thousand becomes five thousand. So eight hundred terabytes in five thousand dollars. That will be just over half a cent, not even a cent, just over zero point five cent. And that is very cheap. So the cost effectiveness and the transfer rate both is there in terms of persistent storage data communication. What is the moral of the story? What is the moral of the calculation? Never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurrying down the highway. That is, if you have a truck full of data, that is much more than any transfer rates. This is the example I'm showing of Amazon Snow Mobile. This is a large truck. It has thousands of hard disks. That is the persistent storage. All are connected through high speed network inside a truck. The total capacity of this snowmobile is 100 petabytes. That is 10 to the power 5 terabytes. Or you can call it as 100 million GB. You can imagine. Imagine this. All is good. Only the disadvantage is the delay is poor. You see the bandwidth and your cost effectiveness, persistent storage, excellent. But when you take this truck from one place to another, the time, transmission time and other things are computed in terms of hours and days, not in millisecond or microsecond, which is in the actual case you see in different transmission media. Everything is good. Transmission time is too much. Twisted pairs, twisted pairs, the name itself is suggesting all these wires are copper wire. So various applications that you use normally accessing web, video conferencing, online gaming, they all rely on transmitting data with a very low delay. That is you want the data to be just within blink of eyes it should go, right? You have seen about the persistent storage truck going from one place to another with all the data that will be in hours and days. But here in the actual scenario, the oldest and the most common transmission media is trans is twisted pair, twisted pair because it is actually twisted. It will consist of two insulated uh, copper wires. Let me show you here. These are two wires. They are different pairs. Okay. Just think about one of them. One of them, the, the copper wires and they are twisted like a helical DNA molecule. That is, we have, just consider this, two wires, insulated, you see the plastic also. So they are one millimeter thing around 
and these wires are twisted as i just said together in a helical form just imagine dna molecule that is why they are twisted pairs and these waves from this different twisted cancel out why we have why we have a dna, DNA molecule shape because electromagnetic waves concept is there so wire if they are twisted the waves will cancel out so the wire will radiate less effectively and the signal being carried out in these wires are the difference is voltage we are not sending sending the absolute voltage between these two wires in the pair there are four pairs you are witnessing i am talking about one pair signal is carried as the difference is voltage not the actual voltage not the absolute voltage why because the noise is there noise will affect both the voltages equally that is it will provide a very good immunity to the external noise because this is affecting both the voltages equally for example 5 and 7 voltages are there in two wires now if noise is there let us increment it by 1 6 and 8 but the difference remains the same so the noise affect the voltage through these wire both the wire in the similar fashion that is the differential remains unchanged so you see here there is shielded twisted pair cable there is unshielded twisted pair cable in the shielded twisted pair we have a braided or foil shield so wire and uh, say a metal is combined to make a protective shielding braided and there is a foil shield also inside but in unshielded twisted pair is just no shielding there just wires and above it it will be outer jacket so we have the shielded and unshielded twisted pairs the telephones they are connected to the telephone company telecom company or telco office by twisted pairs and these these wires both the calls you are calling and even the internet, if you're using say digital subscriber line ADSL internet, both of these go on these lines only. And these pairs can run several kilometers. You don't have to amplify the signals. You don't need to. Okay, it runs several kilometers. There will be no loss of the signal strength. When we have various twisted pair, they run in parallel. For example, coming from the office and going to some you know point. They are bundled together and encased in the protective sheath which you just saw. So the twisted pair, as I said, they will be used, they are used for analog also and digital information. So bandwidth depends on the thickness of the wire, that is the copper wire, and the distance at travel. What are the common varieties? There are various varieties. Mostly the category 5E cable, CAT 5E cable is used. Category 5E is for enhanced. So there are various uh, different categories here. You see. So different land standards may use different uh, twisted pairs in a different way. For example, if 100 Mbps Ethernet is there, it uses two. There are four pairs. So it uses two pairs. One pair for each direction. Okay. 100 Mbps. Four pairs are there, so two of them they are using, one pair for each direction. In case one GPPS Ethernet is there, it will use all the four pairs in both directions simultaneously. Now it is the duty of the receiver to find out, to figure out, to factor out the signal transmitted. Right? This is the duty of the receiver. Okay. So we are talking about twisted pairs. 100 Mbps you thought, some of them use 1 Gbps, all 4 pairs. So the duty is of receiver in this case. Now new things comes, comes up here. What is the new thing? The links. So there can be multiple type of links. So the first which I am showing you, link that can be used in both directions at the same time. It is just like uh, say a two lane road. One traffic, one both the traffic on either side at the same time. This is called a full duplex links, full duplex links. The links that can be used in either direction, but only one at a time, one way at a time, like a single track railroad. These are called half duplex links, half duplex links. And when we see the link that allow traffic 
only in one direction only one direction there is no other direction allowed like a one way street this is called simplex links so in the category seven there are different categories right so category 5 have replaced category 3 because category 3 category 5 has more twist per meter so we have category 8 also yeah, the speeds are quite higher more than 10 gbps means 10 gbps cat 7 only but the speeds are so higher uh, but the problem with K, uh, category 8 i i should not say problem it can only be used uh, 30 meters so category 8 is only suitable to use in the data centers like the cdns okay so there are various uh, uh, cabling now through category 6 these wires were referred to as utp all the th till 6 they were called as utp unshielded twisted pair why because they just had wires and insulators there is no protective sheath so if you take the contrast called category 7 onwards they have shielding on the individual twisted pairs as well as around the entire cable so inside the these all the protective sheet you see that is why the previous one called as unshielded so this cat 7 if you see shielding will do what there are so many interference and cross talk external interference and cross talk it reduces this shielding will reduce coax or coaxial cable there is another common way or common mode of transmission medium is coaxial cable call it as coax this provides a very good shielding and bandwidth if you compare it with the unshielded twisted pair utp against uh, or in contrast with utp better shielding and bandwidth you see this this is the actual coaxial cable so there are two kinds of coaxial cable and the kinds are mostly uh, the distinction is historical 50 ohm cable intended for a digital transmission and then 75 ohm cable this is for analog transmission and also the cable television 50 ohm cable digital 70 ohm cable analog transmission and cable transmission now this you center you see this coaxial cable has a very stiff strong copper wire as the core this one and this is surrounded by this one as the insulating material and this insulator is again encased by a cylindrical conductor and as a closely woven uh, braided mesh network kind of uh, covering so this is braided mesh i'm talking about so uh, the cloth good quality cloth and the metal both of these and the above is protective plastic covering the final one the black you see here the outer conductor is covered in a protective plastic sheet the bandwidth of coaxial cable is very good up to 6 gigahertz many conversation can be simultaneously sent for example television program one television program occupies around 3.5 megahertz You can assume six gigahertz is hertz is too high. The fiber optics is now taking over the coaxial cable in the telephone systems for long distance line. It is taking over the telephone lines for long haul distance lines. And this coax is widely used in cable television, metropolitan area networks, and high speed interconnectivity, especially to homes. Power lines. now power lines how this communication data communication signal communication can be done power lines which you see overhead they are electrical powers providing to these are lines providing to house inside your house there is electrical wiring and this electrical wiring within your house it will be distributing the power to the electrical outlets where you will plug in your various appliances okay so i am talking about this electrical wiring and power lines So these power lines have already been used by the electrical companies. This is already being used. For example, I'll show you the X10 standard for low rate communication. For example, uh, uh, remote metering, in order to know how much is being used and to control the home devices. X10 standard 
I'll just show you here. So the power line used were already there. So this is extend controller, you have transceiver module, appliance module and the lamp. So this is extend standard. So we will try to concentrate on the electrical wiring inside the house. Well, very common scenario. You, we are not uh, talking about power lines here. We are talking about electrical lines inside. How does it work? Power lines as the communication channel or networking. It is using electrical wires inside the home. It's quite convenient to use the power lines for networking. Just simply plug in the TV and receiver into the wall like this. And now they can send and receive movies over the electrical wiring. The data signal you see here will be superimposed on a low frequency power signal. Of course, on the wire that is the, you can call it as an active or a hot wire. As both the signals, they are using the wiring at the same time. Power signal, data signal. This is how power lines are used. But uh, there is a scenario. The household electrical wiring is actually designed to distribute the power signals, not the communication signals, right? The main duty is what? So the electrical signals, they are sent at 50 to 60 hertz. And when we are sending it at 50 to 60 hertz, the thing is, let me show you the world scenario. On different uh, frequency, the electrical signals are sent. For example, 60 hertz in America and uh, Canada, and India, Africa, most part of the world, you see, 60 hertz, there are different voltages also. But the main thing is, electrical signals at this hertz, the wiring will attenuate the higher frequency. Attenuate means lower the, the strength of the signal of the higher frequency, which are on the range of megahertz signals, which are actually required for high data rate communication. So the problem lies here. And when we turn on and off various house appliances, this also causes the data signal to bounce uh, around this wiring. So there will be a transient current that will create an electrical noise. And this will over a wide range of uh, frequencies. Electrical wiring or any wiring in terms of uh, the electromagnetic waves, they will act as an antenna. So they will pick up external signals and also radiate the signals of its own. So in order to meet the regulatory requirement of say some uh, government, you have to avoid the license frequencies. For example, uh, the amateur radio bands. Can you afford it? Just avoiding these radio bands? No. So these are the scenario if you want to use the wiring for communication channel. But still I am saying it is practical to send at least 500 Mbps short distances by using the communication different schemes, techniques, technologies that resist the impaired frequencies and burst of errors. Fiber optics. Before we start fiber optics, let me show you a picture. And this is Moore's law. Moore's law shows or it says that every two year, the number of transistor per chip on a single chip will be doubled. This is the IBM PC. It was in 1981. And this is the present. So the original 1981 IBM PC, it ran at a clock speed of 4.77 megahertz. Mega. Okay, 10 to the power 6 actually. Now, now today's PC, they have multiple cores, 4 core, CPU. And then they are at a speed higher than 3 gigahertz. So you see the comparison, the, the difference, the increment factor or the increase factor, if you just divide this 3 gigahertz by 4.77 megahertz, you'll get around 2500 times. The same time, the communication link, it went from 45 Mbps, this 45 Mbps I'm talking about a T3 line in the telephone system, to 100 Gbps. So what is the increment factor? Just divide these two, you'll get 2000. So the increment in the clock speed and the cores and the increment in the, uh, the communication speed or the bit rate, the 500 is the difference. And the error rate has also, you know, almost become zero. 
Now why the one is 2500, the other is 2000? We are talking about fiber optics and you'll see why this is just 2000, why it has not incremented to the level of the clock speeds. So fiber optics are used for long haul transmission. That is the long distance transmission in the network backbones, high speed local area networks and high speed internet access to home, fiber to home, FTTX like this. So fiber optics, there is 100 Gbps. I'll tell you in the end. So an optical transmission system has three key components. When we are talking about fiber optics, this is an optical transmission system because it is using a light. So it has major three components, key components. The first one will be the light source. The second is actual transmission medium, this one. And the third one is the detector, the detector, the pulse of a light. If there is a light, it will indicate one bit. If the light is not there, it is zero bit. So presence of light is one bit, absence of light is zero bit. So this is the pulse. The transmission medium is, you see here, it's a very ultra thin fiber of glass, normal glass, glass. So the detector, it will uh, generate uh, an electric pulse because the light is coming. Whenever light strikes on this detector, it will generate an electrical pulse. So light source at one end of optical fiber and the other end will have a detector. So you are getting a unidirectional or simplex data transmission system here. So this system is accepting an electrical signal. First it converts and transmits it in the form of light pulses and at the other end the reverse happens. That is it reconverts the output that is the light pulses to electrical signal at the receiver end that is the detector. Okay, so this is how the transmission takes place. Now coming to the physics of fiber optics. Now whenever a light ray passes from one medium to another, there will be certain refraction. Refraction means light will bend depending upon the refractive index or the properties of the two mediums. So it can go away from the perpendicular line of the surface or it can come near that perpendicular line. Let us take an example of uh, silica which is glass and we have the outer area which is air here. Now the ray is refracted that is refraction basically means bending of light rays and this is bending at the silica uh, oblique air boundary because the boundary is silica air. So now the density of glass is higher, density of air is lower. So it will go, it will bend like this means bend away when it goes out from silica to air it bends away from the uh, perpendicular line. Okay, So beta 1 is higher than alpha 1. In the similar case, if we increase alpha 2, the beta 2 will again increase, again bend. So the amount of this reflection totally depends on the medium. So you can call it as a reflection. Uh, the mu, mu is the ind index of refraction, refractive index. Now for certain angle which is called the critical angle, for a certain angle of incidence, the light will be refracted but it will be refracted so much that it will come inside the medium from which it was going out. That is, there is a total internal reflection. Right? This is called total internal reflection. At certain angle, the light will not come out of the, the medium. It will remain inside. So now coming back to our uh, glass or fiber optics, you see here if there are multiple rays coming. All these rays have different modes, they are bouncing actually. So when they are bouncing, they have different modes, uh, they are bouncing at different angles. So each ray has a different mode, that is why this kind of fiber or this kind of glass uh, fiber is called a multi-mode fiber, is called a multi-mode fiber. I will tell you about the microns, uh, this can be used up to 15 km. But if this uh, fiber diameter can be reduced to a few wavelengths of light, that is say 10 microns. As I was telling you, multi-mode fiber is 50 microns. 
and one micron is 10 to the power minus 6 meter. So this is 10 mic microns. So this this is 50 micron. This is 10 micron. That is the you know wavelength of light uh, figure. So the light will go straight. So fiber is, or the glass will now act as a waveguide, and the light can easily propagate in a straight line without bouncing like it was happening in the multi-mode fiber. This is called as a single mode fiber. This is called as a single mode fiber. So this single mode fiber can transmit 100 kilometer, 100 Gbps. So this is quite higher multiple times than the multi-mode fibers. To an extent, it is 50 times higher than the multi-mode fibers. It can transmit 100 Gbps for 100 kilometers. The main thing here to identify here, the optical fibers are made up of glass. This is a glass. And this glass is made from sand. Sand. The sand is everywhere. If you go anywhere, ocean, beach, or uh, you know, even to the desert, you'll get inexpensive raw material, sand. So light, whenever it travels, there will be some losses. That is called the attenuation. That is the signal strength uh, loss. So this attenuation of light through this glass in the fiber optics, it depends on the wavelength, wavelength of light, lambda, and also the physical properties of glass as well. Attenuation, let me tell you, this is the losing of the signal strength. So it can be through absorption, scattering, dispersion, bending. There are so many you know, optics involved here. So these are the physical properties and of the glass, also the wavelength. Now, we always uh, compute the losses in terms of deci uh, dB, decibel. So in order to do that, uh, we define a ratio of input to the, to the output signal power. So if you assume that PI is the input power, PO is the output power. So the ratio, if we are defining it as the signal power. Now, in order to find out in, in decimal, we have to use 10 log 10, base 10, 10 into log 10 and PI by PO. PI by PO, let us say it is 2. We are saying that a factor of 2 loss of the signal power, what will be the attenuation? Attenuation in dB is 10 log 10, 2 is PI by PO, that is around 3 dB, 3 decimal. So this decibel will be explaining in detail, but right now it's a logarithmic way to measure power ratios. So 3 dB loss of power 2. Now light, uh, when it transmits through the fiber, there are different electromagnetic spectrum we are going to talk about. So let us see here, this is, this is the NIR, near infrared part of the spectrum. This is used in practice. There are three wavelength bands that are commonly used at uh, present for the optical communication. The first one is here, 0 0.85. Second one is 1.30. And third one is 1.55 microns. Microns again, that is the power minus 6 meter. So all these uh, bands, the width is 25,000 to 30,000 gigahertz. Gigahertz. So these are the three wavelength bands which we use in fiber optics, optical communication. This 0.85 micron band was used first and the good part was, first the bad part has higher attenuation loss, but the good part is the lasers and the electronics could be made from the same material, that is the gallium arsenide, though it has higher attenuation signal loss. Now coming to 1.30 and 1.55 microns, these bands have good attenuation property, that is uh, less than 5% uh, if you say 1 kilometer you take. So here you see an example of 1.55 micron band. This is widely used in erbium doped amplifiers. So whenever the light uh, travel, uh, when we are talking about fiber. So light pulses, when we sent it through fiber, it spread out its length. Lengthwise they spread. This is the input pulse. So this is the output pulse. So it spreads. And as they propagate, this happens, this is called as chromatic dispersion, chromatic dispersion, okay? Now, the amount of this dispersion is wavelength dependent, lambda, but we can do certain things here. I'll talk about solitons. Now, this is the ordinary pulse. You see, when you send it through fiber, 
there will be a chromatic dispersion you see here also and in the figure on the left also now if we just send this this uh, uh, as a reciprocal of hyperbolic cosine cos h 1 by cos h reciprocal of this, this is the way you know the, these rays are actually a sin omega type kind of thing so if you send it as a reciprocal of hyperbolic cosine it nearly cancels out all the dispersion effects and this is called as solitons or solitons so this is how you can avoid or reduce the chromatic dispersion so there are two views in this fiber cables i am showing you one is the side view of the single fiber here we are, we are showing a top view you can say inside a sheath or a protective sheath there are three fiber three different fibers so fiber optic cables they are almost similar to the coaxial uh, cable but they don't have the braid that the that is the net netted uh, braid protective sheath of uh, the metal and the cloth so the core is surrounded the, the center is the core glass where the light propagates and above this core we have uh, it is surrounded by glass cladding and the mu that is the refractive index is lower than the glass core right because we want total internal reflection then we have the thin uh, plastic jacket to protect the cladding and then we have these grouping of uh, in the bundles so fiber a uh, grouped in bundles and there is a outer protective sheath that is how it is protected so i'll just show you a picture here see how do we lay these fibers because this is an expensive and very you can say skill task so if it is terrestrial just lay it down 1 meter if it is near the seashore then trans oceanic fiber sheets these are buried in trenches and there is a special uh, you know sea plow we does it like this it it looks this is how uh, in the uh, trenches means uh, a kind of you can just dig a hole long hole and then you can put in the deep water they just lie on the bottom just lie on the bottom fibers can be connected in three different ways so what are the three different ways the first you see in the picture we can have connectors so they can terminate in connectors and that can be plugged into fiber sockets so these are the connectors i'm talking about this is the easiest and the best way not best way easiest i i'll tell you why it is not best because the lo, the connector will lose 10 to 20% of the light this is very a reconfigurable system easy but the loss is higher second one is it they can be spliced mechanically this is a machine you see also the mechanical splices lay two carefully cut ends next to each other in a sleeve and then clamp them you can just clamp them so 10% light loss is there as against 20% in the first one the third is fusing the two fibers together so two pieces of fiber they are fused and melted to form a solid connection this is how they are melted there are certain things also in this Uh, you can get some bubbles but it's it will be like seamless connection a fusion splice is almost as good as a single drawn fiber so there are two kinds of light sources because you know light is very important here all 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 is about light so there are two kind of light sources for signaling first is the led light emitting diode and the second one is semiconductor lasers so this is the laser this is a single mode laser and this is for gigabit ethernet long wavelength here you see vcsel vertical cavity surface emitting laser okay so this is for gigabit ethernet short wavelength and the above one of course you see the light emitting diode uh, we have also showed the core and the spot size so we, do, we are not going to the detail of this just to have an idea now they can be tuned in wavelength because the wavelength has to be tuned because it the uh, everything is about light the total internal reflection everything is dependent on light so this uh, they can be tuned in wavelength by inserting certain interferometers it can be fabry parrot or it can be mag zender interferometer and this has to be placed between the source and the fiber the source and the fiber so how does it work the fabry parrot interferometer these are simple resonant cavities consisting of two parallel meters you see these two two mirrors one two 
and the light is incident perpendicular to the mirrors and the length of the cavity selects out wavelength that fit inside an integral number of times m m minus 1 m minus 2 so integral number of times we are not going into the detail again i am saying just to give you an idea then the max sender it separate lights into two beams you see here a uh, beams uh, splitter the two beams travel slightly different distances and they are recombined at the end and are in phase for only certain wavelengths which we want which we want to be tuned in so there are two fabry ferret and the mac zender these are interferometers now the receiving end what will be there there has to be a photodiode so the receiving end of an optical fiber it consists of a photodiode and which gives the electric pulse whenever a light strikes it so the response time of photodiode which convert the signal from optical to electrical domain it limits data rates to about 100 gbps okay now you know the first discussion we had why we are limited to 100 gbps because of this the comparison between fiber optics and copper wire fiber have many advantages over copper wire so the first is the pictures are also shown here just to have a view so the fiber can handle much higher bandwidths as against copper so the bandwidths are higher 100 gbps 100 km right so the first one is this. second one is repeaters are needed only about every 50 km uh, on long lines copper we need every 5 km repeater repeater is to increase the energy if the energy is uh, supposed to be losing we have to increase it fiber also one advantage that it is not affected by power surges or electromagnetic interference even the power failures but copper does fiber is thin and much lighter much lighter than copper and fibers do not leak light and are very difficult for the eavesdropper etc that it that is it is quite difficult to tap what are the advantages and disadvantages fiber optic light more compact one more advantage is that it can transmit enormous amount of data 100 km 100 gbps either digital or analog the external disturbance is well protected by the optical fiber less uh, affected radars and other signals this will not cause any kind of disruption in fiber it has higher bandwidth as i just showed you but the disadvantage is the technology is very complex transmission and reception the equipments are very expensive laying is expensive and you need skilled people to handle it fiber is quite vulnerable to fiber flux as uh, the optical power is higher therefore the optical fiber may also be broken so fiber flux is a criteria splicing i told you three types of fiber splicing are there so how do we combine them it can be mechanical splicing it can be simple connector uh, correction or it can be melt melting and joining so these are very complicated and this is very difficult to maintain the splicing wire and the installation deployment and then maintenance is an expensive investment and task wireless transmission wireless means there will be no wire fiber optic coaxial twisted nothing transmission means sending and receiving the data information bits waveforms so if running a fiber or a cable say uh, from a building to some place to a place where the terrain is difficult undulated terrain mountains jungles swamps the wireless is the best idea the best appropriate way of communication or transmission is wireless now this all started actually the modern wireless digital communication it all started with a research project and it was done by a professor norman abramson of the university of hawaii in the 1970s the electromagnetic spectrum so electromagnetic spectrum is total frequency range every frequency range has some use to human kind all it started with the electron 
when the electron moves it creates an electromagnetic waves whenever it is in motion it creates certain waves called as electromagnetic waves because the electric and magnetic waves are perpendicular to each other and they can propagate through the space even in the vacuum now here is a great name james clerk maxwell now he was the first british not the first british but the first person he was a british physicist and he was the first to predict these electromagnetic waves in 1865 then came the german physicist henrik hertz he observed it first so predicted by maxwell observed by hertz in 1887 so whenever we talk about electromagnetic wave oscillation wave harmonic there are certain uh, physical concept or terminology so the number of oscillation per second if i take one second this is this is one second of periods this is the wave there is another wave so the number of oscillation per second of a wave is frequency this frequency is measured in hertz hertz because of the great name henrik hertz now wavelength is the distance between two consecutive maximum minimum maximum minima and this is uh, designated by or this is shown by written by greek letter lambda lambda so let me just uh, give you more idea about it this is the wave and this is the direction of propagation just as you have a center line through which it propagates now these are the oscillations and as i said there is electromagnetic so electric and magnetic are perpendicular so these are the oscillations the upper part is called as crest the lower part is called as trough the distance between the two crest or the two troughs are wavelength so this is the imaginary center line the highest is it goes or the lowest it goes the distance between the center line and the peak point above and below that is called as amplitude of the wave amplitude frequency is the number of oscillations per second we can also call it as wave cycle passing a given point in a given period of time so these are terminologies that we will be using without any definition so you need to understand it then the speed of light in the vacuum is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second okay all this uh, discussed if you have the electron moving electromagnetic waves can be produced so why not to attach an antenna so attach an antenna which is attached to this electrical circuit these electromagnetic waves they can be sent and received that is broadcast and received by the receiver the sender can send receiver can receive these electromagnetic waves are the basis of all the radio communication so in vacuum all electromagnetic waves of any frequency any frequency they travel at the same speed as i just mentioned it is speed of light represented by c 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second 3 into 10 to the power 5 kilometer per second or 1 fold or 30 cm per nanosecond but when this uh, uh, this electromagnetic waves it goes through or travels through copper or a fiber the speed becomes 2/3 2 by 3 multiple so here we have the electromagnetic spectrum the fundamental relation of this electromagnetic spectrum used widely is c equals lambda into f sometimes f is also called as nu nu so what all you see here here is lambda lambda is the wavelength the distance between the crest or the trough frequency number of oscillations per second c speed of light in vacuum we are right now talking about so this c equals lambda f so c is a constant so lambda that is the wavelength and frequency are inversely related whenever as a rule of thumb we take lambda in uh, meters uh, or the wavelength in meters the frequency will be taken in megahertz lambda into f will be then 300 for example the 3 meter long wave will be 100 megahertz waves that is a 100 megahertz wave will be 3 meter long that is the wavelength i'm talking about while if you go to 1000 megahertz the wavelength will be 0.3 meters 300 3000 megahertz 
पॉइंट वन मीटर्स हाई फ्रीक्वेंसी लो फ्रीक्वेंसी दिस इज हाउ इट इज डिफाइंड दैट इज हाई फ्रीक्वेंसी इज पर सेकेंड इफ देव इज लॉन्ग इफ द वेव इज लॉन्ग दैट इज लो फ्रीक्वेंसी नंबर ऑफ ऑसिलेशन परसेंट आर वेरी लेस सो देव लेंथ हैज टू बी हायर दैट इज the wave if frequency is less lambda will be higher because they are inversely proportional because c is the constant and similarly if the frequency is higher the wavelength has to be less small this is the relationship in electromagnetic spectrum there are different range there are different hertz there are different wavelength there are different ways we use it okay there will be different nature of wave because one will be higher wavelength one will be lower wavelength and consequent consequently the frequency so if you see here we have the radio waves radio waves the the wavelength is of the order of a soccer field see then we have microwaves infrared visible visible is very small ultraviolet x rays gamma rays so this uh, radio waves we use for the am radio the then it comes fm radio then we have the different ways you know for medical purposes we use x rays and there are radioactive elements the radioactive work done in the gamma rays uh, uh, electromagnetic range so the radio microwave infrared visible light portion of the electromagnetic spectrum they all can be used for transmitting the data information how by modulating the amplitude frequency and phase we call it as amplitude modulation frequency modulation and phase modulation we'll talk about that the ultraviolet rays the x rays the gamma rays they are having high frequencies the wavelength is very small very sharp they are they are very difficult to produce even the modulation is very uh, difficult and they do not propagate well through the buildings so they have their own use but they are dangerous for the living being if you know x ray person he himself is out of the room when he takes the x ray of your of uh, if you go to for the x ray that is that is how much it is uh, difficult uh, for the living being even the gamma rays you know the ultraviolet rays we have these all the sunscreen for that so the itu international telecommunication union uh, the names they have given earlier that is the lf the low frequency it goes from 1 km to 10 km this is the frequency range i am talking about and uh, this frequency range is 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz then we have this lf uh, for low frequency mf for medium frequency h for high frequency no one wa was thinking at that time that the higher frequency will be used for the communication purposes so then came the higher bands like the vhf very high frequency band then ultra ultra high frequency super super high frequency extremely high frequency tremendously high frequency these were there frequency hopping spread spectrum so the name is suggesting frequency will hop will jump will change from one frequency to another and this spread spectrum is using all the frequency range spreading it then so frequency hopped spread spectrum a transmitter hops the frequency changes the frequency jumps the frequency from frequency to frequency hundreds of time per second as you see in the picture also and it is quite popular in military communication so if you i'll, I'll just take a time for example 625 microsecond just giving you a uh, idea that this is the time and the change of frequency time so as i said they are very popular in the military use military communication because the, the frequency is hopping changing if one frequency is used it can be found but if you are jumping through the frequency hard to detect and almost impossible to jam jam the signal stop the signal or destroy the signal and because it is changing the it offers very good resistance to fading as the signals they may take different paths also different paths different signals that is the fading is less multi path fading you can talk about and because i said this say if particular frequency is uh, affected by a certain thing maybe if for jamming or maybe the, it is absorbed by rain for example now that particular frequency will be uh, will remain unused but because the frequency is jumping that particular frequency will be only affected other frequency won't be affected 
So it also offers resistance to narrow band interference as receiver will not be stuck on an impaired frequency for long because it is jumping. Now you see a very beautiful woman. You must appreciate her beauty and her brain also. Why I am saying that? Because she is not only the actress, she is the inventor. First let me tell you this frequency hopping spread spectrum. This technique is also used commercially in Bluetooth. Uh, in the older version of wireless LAN, Wi-Fi 802.11. So this technique was co-invented by the Austrian-born film star Hedy Lamar or the birth name Hedwig Keisler. She was uh, responsible for the development or invention of this. The story about her is her first husband. He was actually the armaments or arm manufacturer. And because she was in, they were in love. So she told him that, you know, how do we block the radio signals? And these radio signals were actually blocked because it was used at then for controlling the torpedoes. Now uh, it is underwater. He, uh, I'm talking about. Now when she came to know this, she got very very horrified because when she came to know that his husband is selling the weapons to the for, to Hitler. She was horrified and then she just left. She fled disguising as a maid, came to Hollywood and then she became famous movie actress, Hadi Lamar. Okay. Okay. Now she invented frequency hopping to help and he, she actually helped the allied war effort. Everyone against Hitler allied. Direct sequence spread spectrum. Now you see here, this is the user inf uh, information data. There is a code to, there is called a spreading code and finally, if you combine them, you get the spreaded information. So direct sequence spread spectrum, it uses code sequence. It uses code sequence that multiple people say, for example, they have different code. And this code sequence, they use to spread the data signal over a wire frequency band. And this is quite used uh, commercially and this is a very good spectrally efficient way to let the multiple signals, they sh can share the same frequency band. The so signals, they are given different codes. For example, one has been given one code, other has been given two codes. We'll talk about this code division multiple access in detail. Right now it is just a code, code division multiple access. So the 3G mobile uh, telephone networks when they came, this forms uh, CDMA forms the basis, GPS also it is used. The uh, GPS signals are on CDMA. And because of this, because we have multiple uh, code, so it can tolerate interference and fading because only a fraction of desired signal is lost. Ultra wide band communication. So I told you about frequency hopping, then the other one which is which were using the CDMA, then we have the ultra wide uh, ultra wide band. This is the underlying. You see, all these are working here. There is underlying uh, figure. So ultra wide band, the name suggests this kind of communication. It sends a series of, they send a series of low energy rapid pulses. And at the same time, changing or varying their carrier frequency. This car carrier frequencies is changed to communicate information. Okay. So the UWB, you can define it as a signal that have a bandwidth of at least, at least 500 megahertz, 500 megahertz. Or if you take the frequency band, the center frequency you take, it should be at least 20% of the central frequency. So with this uh, bandwidth, this UWB or ultra wide band, this has a great potential to communicate hundreds and hundreds megabits of data per second. This is how it works. It can tolerate strong interference from other narrowband signals and UWB it uh, doesn't interfere with the carrier signals in the same frequency band. This is, this is the whole concept here. And this can also be used in imaging through the solid objects. Why? Because it passes through it ground walls and bodies and also it can be used as a part of a precise location system. That is why because it is going through solid objects and that is why it is used as for imaging, precision radar imaging and precise location systems, so location tracking technologies. So ultra wide, wide band, secure 
accurate, reliable, real time, low energy. So these are the properties of this UWB. Coexistence is also. Radio frequency, radio transmission. So this is the whole electromagnetic spectrum and every part of that spectrum is used for communication. So in radio transmission, we will talk about various bands, all the spectrum. So coming to RF, that is the radio frequency. What is frequency? The number of oscillations per second. So we are talking about electromagnetic waves transmission. And here the range is from 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. That is the radio frequencies, any of the electromagnetic waves frequency that lie in the range extending from 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. So these uh, waves can even jump the mountains. They can travel long distances. If you have some building, they can even penetrate the buildings. This RF or RF mode radio frequency is used widely for communication information exchange purposes. It can be inside your home. It can be outside. And the important part is this uh, radio frequency, radio frequency waves, they are omnidirectional. Omni means in the direction everywhere, 360 degree direction. Travel in all the direction, can be sent in the other directions and can be taken received in all the directions. Bidirection means two direction, unidirectional means one direction. So this is if this is transmitter, we have a receiver. So the transmitter and receiver, we don't need to align them linearly. That is, they don't need to be carefully aligned physically because both of them are omnidirectional. Radio waves and other waves which we are going to talk about, the properties are frequency dependent. Frequency dependent, you know the formula, this wavelength into frequency is the speed of light. Frequency, wavelength, they are interdependent, inversely proportional. So that is how we will talk about frequency, but we are talking about lambda also, the wavelength also, because they are inversely proportional. C is a constant, but we will, in these terms, we'll only talk about the frequency. So radio, uh, these waves are frequency dependent. Now the low frequency and high frequency. At low frequency, the radio waves, they pass through obstacles easily. Low frequency means the wavelength is quite high. Wavelength is from the center line, the peak of that wave. So it can even go up to or jump up to these uh, different mountains. So power of the wireless transmission, it reduces with the square of distance. Power of that wave. So power and this distance, they are directly related. Okay. So power and wireless, uh, this transmission reduces with uh, square of distance. Now this is a relation of power. Now I'll show you the, the relationship after this, the relationship of the path loss. That I'll show you just now. But for, uh, for time being, the power is computed like this. We have the distance directly proportional and the lambda in the inverse. So what I'm saying is power falls sharply with distance. That is the uh, factor is 1 by r square. r is the distance, right? So power will sh definitely uh, reduce. Attenuation will take place. The power will reduce. And this is not only true with the radio waves. It will happen with every wave. There will be some uh, attenuation and there is a power relation. The long wave uh, length, that is the low frequency, they have less loss. And these short wave I'm showing you, this these are uh, high frequency, they have more loss. So the attenuation, we'll call it as path loss. Attenuation is the loss of energy, loss of, uh, you can say, the content so that we need to reboot, reboost it somewhere. Okay, coming to the high frequencies. At high frequencies, these radio waves, they almost travel in straight lines and in, and they also bounce of the obstacles. That is, if some obstacle are there, they will strike the obstacle and they will bounce off. So this is the, therefore, uh, the high frequency radios, these waves are also absorbed by rain, rain, water, and also obstacles. So the high frequency, low, the low frequency, they are not, not that much absorbed by rain and obstacles because the wavelength are higher. So high frequency radio waves, they are absorbed by rains and obstacles. Now this is the relationship of path loss. Now path loss is inversely proportional to the distance. So I showed you that how does this power reduces with the factor of 1 by r square. 
So this is a path loss and uh, normally the power etc we try to compute in the form of ratio and then we can convert this all into decibels we're taking logs so that is not the discussion here but just for the sake of completion we have d as a distance f as a frequency lambda as a wavelength and c of course the speed of light now with fiber coaxial cable or twisted pair the attenuation that is the signal drop this also drops by the same fraction per unit distance for example the twisted pair for 100 meter there will be a loss of 20 db 20 db it will lose with radio the signal will drop by the same fraction as the distance doubles i told you about the uh, ratio or you can the factor multiplied is the uh, you can say a reciprocal of the distance so it is 6 db per doubling in the free space free space is what the space we see so this is the difference between the twisted pair and the free space how does the attenuation take place so this means that the radio waves they can travel long distances and therefore if two people are talking they are sending the radio waves the interference will take place that is if the, the constructive interference can also be there destructive can also be there so the destru destructive interference will will uh, you say attenuate both the signals so therefore this is the reason why the government actually regulate tightly regulate the use of radio transmitters everyone cannot use uh, these range of frequencies right because of the interference if you talk other per person is talking there will be interference so the government has to come in between and they have to regulate the use of these radio transmitters this is the reason this is the reason is interference remember in this radio transmission, as I said, from 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz, there are different bands being defined. So these are the VLF, LF, MF, HF, VHF, UHF, SHF and EHF. Now these are very low frequency, low frequency and medium frequency. Then we have others also, you know, high frequency, very high frequency, ultra high frequency, super high frequency, extremely high frequency. Now as I said, it starts from, as we know that it is 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. So when you talk about VLF, we are talking about 3 kilohertz to 30 kilohertz. LF, we are talking about 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz. MF, we are talking about 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz. Okay, this is how the wavelength will also change. This I am talking about the frequencies. So in this VLF, LF and MF band, the radio waves, they follow the ground. That is, they will take the path or the shape of the ground. This is how they travel, near the ground. And uh, for example, if you see here in the picture, the AM radio, amplitude modulated modulation, this radio was broadcasting, this uses the MF band. And if you talk about FM radio, it will use the VHF band. So this is how uh, the FM is quite clearer than this AM, AM radio uh, transmission. This AM part that is called uh, the uh, MF part. So radio waves in these parts, they pass through building quite easily. That is why inside house also, you can easily tune into your favorite radio station. Okay, Out, outdoors, indoors, both. Uh, but the problem is, uh, with these three bands, which we just talked about, or uh, the near band for data communication is the low bandwidth. The bandwidth is very less. Bandwidth is nothing but the difference of the frequency. Now, if you go above the HF and VHF band, very high, very uh, this high frequency and very high frequency. Here, the ground waves are actually absorbed by the Earth, as I told you, when the fre frequency will increase, the wavelength will decrease and that will be bound to be absorbed by Earth. But there are certain waves that may reach the ionosphere. Ionosphere is around 100 to 500 km, that is the layer of our Earth atmosphere. So there are free ions. Now these free ions, there is a, when the wave goes or, uh, you know, there is a, there is a technique or a physical phenomena called refraction. So these some of the rays, they come back, they are refracted back. This ionosphere plays a very important role in this. So I am talking about the HF band and VHF band. Ionosphere, so this goes and as I said that there is a refraction and other physical activities also taking place. So these, they came, they come back to earth or they are sent back to the earth by the ionosphere because the ionosphere is all about ions, free ions. So this refraction, that is how we can communicate. For example, the hams, you might be knowing about it, amateur radio operators, hams, they use this band to talk a large distance, long distance. 
just because ionosphere is there. And also we have HF and VHF. These bands are used normally by the military for communication. If you are going into the field or uh, into military, you must be knowing or uh, you should know HF and VHF. Microwave transmission. Now you might be using microwave at your home. You will be, you know, boiling water. And that is just that the waves that will give energy to the molecules of water and that is how it heats up. So microwave transmission above the 100 megahertz, the wave, the electromagnetic waves, they travel in straight lines, almost straight lines. And since they can travel in straight lines, there is a possibility so that we can narrowly focus them as a, as a beam, you can say. So these waves, they travel in a straight line. Now, as I said, whenever the frequency is uh, higher, it is more likely that they can travel in the straight lines. And we can concentrate all the energy into small beam by means of this parabolic antenna. You might be having an antenna at your house, the parabolic antenna. So what, the, what it does, that all the light, all the waves, they can be, because at the center point, there is a receptor. So there is a focus and that receptor will give you the signal. So these can be easily focused and this small beam, this energy can be, you know, concentrated. Uh, for example, the satellite TV dish, and this gives a very high uh, signal to noise ratio. That is a good signal. Signal to noise ratio is uh, normally we talk it in terms of deci decibel. We call it as SNR. This is nothing but the signal to noise ratio and we represent it in decibels. Log 10 log 10, the base is 10. So this is how the signal and noise ratio is defined. But you get a very good signal to noise ratio. But the thing is, the transmission and the receiver, the antennas have to be very accurately aligned. This can be done once, but still you have to align it. Because as I said, they travel in straight line and they are narrowly focused. So microwaves, for, for this reason, they are directional. That is, they travel in straight line. So you need the repeaters, repeaters uh, at certain distances, periodically. What uh, Every 50 kilometers normally, we require the energy boosters. Repeaters are the signals will attenuate and you have to increase the energy, boost it. So in microwaves, uh, you will be learning about uh, or hearing about ka, ku, k. These are just parts of the band. And they are L, S, C, X, Q, Q, K, K, like this. So the distance between the re repeaters, how they are related. This is related, that is the square root of tower height. That is higher the tower, you need the repeater at a long distance. So distance between the repeaters, repeaters are energy boosters, energy boosters, because there will be attenuation. So normally at 50 kilometers we give, but this is not just 50 kilometers a number. This distance between the repeat repeaters has a relationship with the square root of the tower height. This you need to understand. Okay. I'll give an example. Uh, for example, you have a hundred meter tower. Can you imagine? Can you have a hundred meter tower? Yes, you can have, but normally it is not possible. You can have 20 meters, 30 meters or even 40 meters. But 100 meters, Hussein Bolt, he is running 100 meters. You can see the distance he runs in a, you know less than 10 seconds. So this is the repeater. Now repeaters can be 80 kilometers uh, apart, but normally we don't have this much. So we have 40, 50 kilometers of repeater. So microwaves, they do not pass through buildings well. Why? You know very well the frequency is higher. The wavelength will be less and this is the situation. But one more scenario arises here. We, we have talked about that the microwave transmission or the waves, they are uh, having high frequency, so they can be focused, but still there is, there is atmosphere. There are certain things going on. There will be still some divergence in the free space. Divergence means it will change the path because of various reasons. For example, you see here, there is a earth lower atmosphere and you know all the weather activity, various activities are happening here. You have droplets, you have different kinds of, you know, scattering going on, diffraction, refraction going on. So some waves, so they can be refracted off by the low lying atmospheric layers, low lying, and they may take a slightly long to arrive. Some may come directly, some may be refracted by the earth, earth atmosphere and some may come from the ground. So those which, which are in the phase, that is okay. But those which are arriving out of phase, and you know that there will be destructive interference. So these signals will cancel out. And this scenario, this is called as multi-path fading. This is the only thing which we called as multi-path fading. And as I said, the weather is the important factor. So it is dependent on the weather and it is dependent on the frequencies also. 
higher frequency will create higher multipath uh, multipath fading so what will happen what the operators do they because they are being assigned a particular frequency range by the government so they keep 10% of their channel as idle as a spare because when this multipath fading will happen it may wipe out a, a particular frequency band so this 10% part that they have kept for this use they will use it and since we know because uh, the data rates people want higher that is why this this force or this requirement is driving wireless network operators for more higher frequencies but here the scenario changes because you know at around 4 gigahertz 4 gigahertz is a very high frequency the water is the key because there rain absorption take place the electromagnetic waves will be absorbed by water here so the solution is what you know the only thing is that with that particular uh, band if they are absorbed by rain we can take another route or you can have multiple links and they may be used this is the only solution otherwise you know people who are listening like you guys you must come with certain solution of that so we have certain uh, advantages over fiber of microwave transmission uh, there are certain uh, first of all you don't uh, because laying of cable is is really a task in microwave transmission you don't want to do it or you would you wouldn't do it microwave is somewhat relatively inexpensive once you establish it it will be done the difference of microwave and fiber what is the difference and uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages so in microwave the first thing is uh, it is easy to cross the space few land needed avoid the private land then so microwave just take a small part some uh, say plot and 50 kilometers away i take another very small uh, plot and then you can erect the 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 towers in optical fiber optical cable needs large land because you have to lay you have to lay down the fiber it's actual wire the second thing is microwave the investment is quite low and it can be done in short period and it is quite easy to maintain also but in optical fiber you have high investment you, you, everything is expensive fiber the skill set the the other things maintenance and the construction period is also higher in microwave the anti uh, natural disaster that is it can be restored fast if the tower goes down you can just uh, erect it again but in natural in, the, in this kind of disaster if some tsunami or something earthquake comes the outside cable maintenance natural disaster is is a strong influence in optical fiber when it comes to microwave you need to, uh, to apply for the frequency license because you are using the radio frequency that has been licensed by the government you have to buy it but in the same uh, uh, scenario you don't need any license because you are using fiber you know so you don't we are going point to point so you don't need any frequency to be bought and in microwave the weather and the landform all the landform can be undulated it can be water it can be you know uh, ditch or crest and trough so the performance will be affected by water what weather water will absorb it and the landform will be uh, will be affecting the microwave transmission but when it comes to fiber the performance is quite stable and it is less influenced by uh, from outside once you lay it down it will work for years so this is the advantages uh, advantage of actually fiber over this and uh, the microwave has a low transmission capacity you know always that wireless will always give you low capacity but fiber is you know 100 gbps the, the photodiode receptor is the only limitation otherwise you will get 100 gbps and more so high transmission capacity of fiber is there infrared transmission infrared range infrared transmission let me show you first that this is your uh, uv here you have microwave infrared is here and it starts with the red light after just the red light of visible range visible range so from here it starts uh, we named it as nir swir nwir lwir that is near infrared short wave infrared like this medium wave infrared so these are different parts where different uh, devices are being made so infrared light is the electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength which is longer than that of a visible light and this is measured from the nominal edge of visible red light as i just explained and this is employed in the short range communication very short range Uh, for example computer peripherals personal digital assistant and electronic devices so these unguided infrared waves they are widely used for short range communication in a in a room 
So the remote you use for the television, the remote you use for your air conditioner is using this infrared transmission. So the remote controls of your television, any player, they all use this kind of infrared communication. So this infrared communication, as I said, they are using certain band and it is for just a small distance. That is why they are directional, they are quite cheap and they can be easily built. But the scenario is that they do not pass through solid objects. What does it mean? That is, if you are, if your brother is standing in front of you and you are trying to use your television or you know, switch on, it will not. So, if you are, your brother is in a different room and he is using remote control for air conditioner, your remote con control and his remote control will not interfere. So, intra infrared system in one room will not interfere with the other one which is just adjacent. Because of this reason, the security against the eavesdropping is better than that of the radio systems because even the a, a person who is adjacent to the room, you, this is not inter, interfering. You don't need any government license. Government is not uh, giving any license for IR transmission. The infrared communication, it has a limited use because the distance is less on the desktop. So for communication, it is not very major role playing. But still we don't need to know about this uh, IRDA, Infrared Data Association standard uh, to connect the computer and printer. So you, you see a USB device and you just can connect it to the computer and here you see the IR conversion. These kind of gadgets, these are there like uh, IRDA, Infrared Data Association. Now light transmission. So how can you transmit data or do communication using the light transmission? See, the unguided optical signaling, you can also call it as free space optics. This is the light, visible light we are talking about. So free space optics, these are used for centuries. How do you know? You see here, Paul Revere, he was using or he used the binary optical signaling from the old North Church. Now let me show you the picture. This is the actual picture. And this actually happened. So this is Paul Revere. He is waiting for the signal from the old North Church Tower. So at that time also, the free of space optics communication was taking place. What is the modern, modern application, today's application? You can connect the local area networks in two buildings via or using the laser mounted on their rooftop. So these are two buildings. You have a laser, guided laser, or you can say focus laser. And then you have a receptor, which is called as a photo detector. And these both buildings have to have. So here you have one building, laser you are sending, and here you have a photo detector. Same thing if you want to send from here, you also have to have a laser on left hand side, photo detector on the right hand side. So optical signaling, they are using lasers. As I said, it is, uh, it has to be focused, so unidirectional. Each end needs its own laser and photo detector. And this has actually happened in uh, one of the conference. I'll tell you a story. But these schemes offer a very high bandwidth at very low cost and it is quite secure. Because you know, the narrow or laser beam, it is very difficult to tap or to eavesdrop or to stop. It's quite easy to install. Once it is installed, you can always use it. And the most important part is it does not require a license from the government. So I was telling you a story that in a, in a conference, what, what happened? It was for three days. So the, the organizers, they asked the, the company that please uh, correct the land. They said, why to, why to lay the cable just for three days? So they denied. So these people, they did what? They actually use this laser beam uh, detector or this kind of free space optics, optical signaling for connecting the land. Evening, evening they checked and it was all right, but it rained. The next day it was not working. So this is because of the convection, etc. Uh, this didn't work, but they came to know that this is the problem. I'll tell you that the laser's strength, a very narrow beam is there, but this is not, not the strength also and weakness also. Because aiming laser beam, say one millimeter wide at a target the size of a pin head, which is 500 meters away, this requires someone very special, like a marksmanship, you know, skilled, skilled person. So this is, this is like, you need a person like Paul Revere. And as I said, the wind and the temperature changes, uh, it distorts the beam. I just told you a story about that because there are scintillation, absorption, uh, scattering. This all happens and this, this will be affected by this. The laser beams, they cannot uh, penetrate if there is rain or thick fog. From waveforms to bits. So here we are going to discuss about the 
theoretical basis for data communication. Wherever we are communicating, sending and receiving data on different medium, on different devices, what is the underlying thought? What is the theoretical basis? What is the science? Then we will talk about the modulation. That is how to convert the analog waveforms to bits and vice versa. Finally, multiplexing. How can a single physical medium can be employed, can be used to carry multiple simultaneous transmissions? The theoretical basis for data communication. The whole idea or the story is why do we want some science or theory for communicating. There are two computers, two devices, computer number one, computer number two. We know that computer only know, understand binary digits, zero or one. Same for the computer number two. But the transmission medium can be anything. It can be coaxial cable. It can be fiber optic. It can even be wireless medium. So the whole story is these bits have to be sent on an analog medium which is actually a wire and this has to be converted back to digits on the receiver side. So how do we send the information? On a wire, electrical wires, electronic wires. So we have in electronics electrical we have voltages and currents. So the best way is to use this voltage and current and send but voltage is a specific value and voltage can change according to time for example sometimes v1 voltage say 5 volt sometimes it will be 3 volt 2 volt i'm taking just example it can be even 0 volt so to vary how to vary this volt how to change this voltages and consequently the current and on the basis of that can the data be transferred can the information be transferred? For example, at 5 volt, you can say 1 is being transferred. At 0 volt, say 0 is being transferred. So, if at all it is possible that this voltage and current that can be thought or can be represented in the form of a function, a single valued function because voltage is changing with time. So, the function that is the voltage or a current function changing with the time. So we know that function is what? Fx. X is the variable which changes. It's a variable. For example, if you have Ax square plus b. Now when you have a function called Ax square plus b, this is an example. Now this function, we are able to analyze it properly, mathematically. So this is a, this will be a very good idea to model the behavior of the signal also in terms of this kind of or this way of expressing okay so we will have we will try to demonstrate or write it in the form in the form of a function time varying function fourier analysis or fourier analysis in the uh, the last r is sometimes not spoken it's fourier analysis see i'll start with a very basic example if you are learning you are not understanding you can ask your brother you can ask your sister, okay? Even if you are not understanding certain stuff, you can go to your tutor and you will be able to understand. He may guide you. So the whole story for your analysis is that if at certain domain or certain place, for example, time domain, for example, we have different voltages, different currents. At T1, certain voltage is there. Some At time 2, voltage has changed or the current has changed. This is the time domain because at de depending upon time, the voltage is changing. If it is difficult to understand this in this scenario, for example, let us take one more example. Uh, an image, image has pixels, picture element. So this is X and Y, so it's a spatial domain. So if certain things are not easily understandable or representable in a spatial domain or a time domain, why not to transfer them into frequency domain? Frequency is what? Number of oscillation per second or num certain numbers, how many times that number has occurred? 
has come. So the basic thing is that if you are not learning something, go to tutor. If you are not understanding something in the time domain, why not to change it into the frequency domain? So the total idea of Fourier analysis is this only. That is, the time domain, the Fourier analysis converts from time domain to the frequency domain. And then we analyze the signal. Before I go ahead, let me tell, tell you about this gentleman. He is Jean Baptiste Joseph Fourier. As I said, the last R is not spoken from 1768 to 1830. Now he gave a very crazy idea. Why it was called a crazy idea? Because he said any periodic function can be rewritten as a weighted sum of sines and cosines of different frequencies. He said that if certain function is there, which is periodic, it can be written as the weighted sum of sine term and cosine term. Now most of the people didn't understand and those who understood, they didn't believe. The big names like Langrange, Laplace, Poison, all the big wigs, they didn't believe it. Not until 1878 when it was actually, his thought was actually translated and it came to be true and that was called now as the Fourier series is the basis of all the digital communication. So this is the expression he formed. You can say a formula, you can say an expression and he said that a time varying periodic signal, that the signal has to be periodic. This can be represented as a series of frequency components or harmonics. He said a function has to be there, uh, say a GT function, it is changing with time and it has a period of T that is every T, every, uh, every time after T it will repeat itself. That is why it is a periodic function. So for example sine function or a cosine function, it will always repeat itself after 2 pi, 360 degree. So sine and cos are periodic functions. So he said any function which is periodic, this can be constructed, this can be written as the sum of number of sines and cosines. He also said it has to be weighted. Final this expression has come. This is the expression he said. So let me tell you what all are here. You have to concentrate on sine and cos term. The sine term is there. What is the weight? A n. A sub n. The cos term. What is the weight? B sub n. And what is the constant term? C by 2. Now the f here is the f is as I said it, it has to have a time period. It is a periodic function. The frequency is number of oscillation per second. Frequency is 1 by time period. This is the fundamental frequency of that particular function. A n and B n. These are sub. These are the sine and cosine amplitudes. You can also call it as in a no normal mathematical terms coefficients. So you say here a n and b n. These are the sine and cosine amplitudes of the nth harmonics. They are not just harmonics. They are the terms. We call it harmonics here. Basically you will put n equals 1. That will be first harmonic. n equal to 2. Next harmonic like this. And what is the constant? C is the constant. This will just determine the mean value of the function. Normally, whenever we derive something, we always think that everything is from the origin. But this constant has been added to experience the real life term. Okay. Now, let me just write here uh, any term. Say 5 sin, I am writing just theta. 5 sin theta plus 12 cos theta. So, this is the weighted sum of sin and cos. What is the weight of sin? 5. What is the weight of cos 12? This can be your first harmonic if you put n equals 1. Let me say that if I am putting n equals 2, it can become, it just can become 12 sin theta plus 13 cos theta. I am just taking a random expression. So these are harmonics. 12 is the weight. 13 is the weight. 12 is weight for sin theta. 13 is the weight for cos theta. And this kind of decomposition is nothing but the Fourier series. Fourier series. Now this is the expression Fourier has given. 
Now the question comes how to find out this an and bn. All these are sub, okay, subscript. An, bn, and what is the constant term? So Fourier, he also gave us the expressions for these three constants. From Fourier series, the function can be reconstructed and vice versa. So this gt or any function you take, we are taking function as gt, which is a which is our periodic function. We'll take an example also. So from Fourier series, the function can be reconstructed. And please note the sigma or the addition is from one to infinity. What I'm trying to suggest is that if period t, that is time period, is known. The frequency, the amplitudes are known, that is the coefficients, the original function of the time, this can be found, this can be retrieved by performing the sum of this equation. That is why it is 1 to infinity. When you actually run it from 1 to infinity, all these terms with the coefficient, you will get the actual function. So the data signal with a finite duration, this can be handled by imagining that the entire pattern is repeating. That is why we are calling it, it as a periodic function. That is from t to 2t will be same as 0 to t will be same as 2t to 3t. Right? Now the question comes how to find out this constant terms a n, b n and uh, the c term, constant term. It's quite easy. It's all uh, you know trigonometry. Trigonometric expression we'll use. And it's quite easy. Just have to multiply the whole expression which you see here by sine 2 pi k f t. Multiply both sides by sine 2 pi k f t and just integrate with the period that is from 0 to t. So when we integrate it, whole expression multiplied by sine 2 pi k f t, what do we get? We get a n. Because all the term of Bn will vanish. This is simple trigonometry. I'm not going into the detail. Just letting you know that how to find out this An. Similarly, Bn, B sub n. Same thing will happen. Now multiply the whole expression. Because earlier we multiplied with sine 2 pi kft. Now we'll multiply the whole by cos 2 pi kft. Same thing. Again we will integrate it from 0 to t and now we will get b sub n because all the term containing a sub n will be uh, cancelled, will be 0. And how about finding the constant? a and b found, b and b found, first we multiplied by sine then cosine. In order to find out the constant term, we just integrate both the side with the period and finally we will get the constant term. So this all was done by Fourier and all these operations, the final, the coefficients or you can say the harmonics, a n, b n and constant term, the expression is what you see here, right? You can call it a harmonics here, but these are the different terms. What is the relevance of this Fourier series or these expressions in terms of data communication? Because when we are dealing with real channels, actual communication, different frequency will be affected differently. That is, data communication, real channels affect different frequency signals in a different manner. Uh, for understanding this, let us take an example. And we will take an example of actual transmission of bits. For example, you are trying to transfer, say, a character B. Now the ASCII character B, we want to transmit. We know that the ASCII value of small b is 98. So we will encode it in a 8-bit byte. So that will be 011000010. I'll just try to calculate and tell you that this is 98. So this is 28 and this is... 32, 64, now I just add 64 plus 32 plus 2, you get 98. So this is what we want to send. This is a proper bit pattern. And the whole idea is this bit pattern has to be in the formation of sine and cos we have to send. And we have to retrieve as well. So this is the actual 
binary signal which we want to send okay this is computer is transmitting a digital device is transmitting and it is nothing but just a voltage please remember it is just voltage so what will be the fourier analysis what is the fourier fourier analysis result so the coefficient that is the a n a sub n b sub n and constant will come like this now how do we get this this is this is a very big question i'll just give you a basic hint how do we get this a n and b n it's a you know another science or aspect of mathematics that will take a long time but i'll just give you an idea how do we achieve this these expression a n and b n so first of all you have to understand we are dealing with 8 bits here so let me write bit here 0 1 1 0 0 0 1 0 these are eight bits we are trying to send b now what are the constants b a n b n and c n the constant is the expression is the formula is n by 4 n is the number of ones in the byte it regardless of the position so how many ones are there 1 2 3 3, three ones are there so 3 by 4 you got the constant now let us come to a n and b n we already have a formula a n is 2 by t integration 0 to t g t sin 2 pi n f t d t same for b n. Now the function is g t. This is 8 bit. So I am going from 0 to 1, 1 to 1, 1 to 0 like this. So from 0 to 1 we can easily assume that this is a piece wise constant function. What I am trying to say here is that we have to find out g t. What is the g t? When I am saying I am going from one place to another from 0 to 1. it can be 0 to 1 it can be 1 to 1 it can be 1 to 0 so it will be a straight line it's, it's actually a piece wise linear constant a piece wise constant because i am not going to integrate from first bit till eighth bit i am going to integrate from first bit to second bit second bit to third bit third bit to fourth bit like this till eighth bit right so basically gt is a constant if we just take one one bit it is constant so we will integrate it and assume that this this function gt is nothing but a constant so there is no gt now okay now we know the expression of an and bn so there is one term you have to understand that integration is from 0 to t but this is for whole time period but we are talking about 8 bit so how to divide this 8 bit into time period so we are introducing this kt by 8 till k plus 1 t by 8 because k is varying from 0 to 7 0 to 1 1 to 1 1 to 0 0 to 0 0 to 0 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 so that is why gt is constant and we integrate it from kt a by 8 till k plus 1 t by 8 first with the cos term second with the sin term you know the integration you know sin sin and cos integration finally when you put the limits you have two expression for a n and b n a sub n and b a sub n right i hope you got a basic idea i'm not going into the detail this is how we get a n and b n now this constant or you can say the harmonics the final term is we have not achieved because the actual byte is b we have sent so there are three ones here 1 2 6 so now you have to put n equals 1 n equals 2 n equals 6 and then you have to add so put 1 n equals 1 in both i'm just telling about b and say k equals 1 you have uh, k equals 1 not n k equals 1 k equals 2 k equals 6 and then you add them finally you will get the actual harmonic or the coefficient or the b n term similarly you will do it for the other one you will get the a so this is how this has come i hope you got the idea now we have got this a b and c that is the coefficients and the constant these are nothing but the harmonics also but how to represent these in terms of actual value let us say we are putting n equals 1 that is a1 and b n b a1 and b1 so when we are putting n equals 1 this is the first harmonic so a1 we are finding a2 we are finding we are squaring it and adding it and taking under root So that is the root mean square amplitude so the root mean square amplitude this is the first harmonic which you see in the figure also now let us take n equals 2 in a and b n 
Now, when you put n equals 2, then you will square them, add them, take the square root. So, let me show you here. So this is the a1 plus a, a1 square plus a2, a1 square plus b1 square under root. This is the first harmonic. Second one is a2 square plus b2 square under root. This is the second harmonic. Okay. So, the square of these values, which I just told you, they are proportional to the energy transmitted at the corresponding frequency, at different frequencies, right? No transmission can transmit signal in this, in any channel without losing some power. Without losing power, it is impossible. So, if all the Fourier components, which we are calling it as A and B and, they were equally reduced, the resulting signal will only be reduced in the amplitude but they will not be distorted they will not be distorted the shape remains same this is how we said i will talk about actual bit how many harmonics we need to send this bit formation okay because the, we have to limit there can be multiple harmonics. You can argue that it can be A1 till A infinity. But how many harmonics do we need? Before that, bandwidth limited signals. Now what happens? This, this is an unfortunate thing that all the transmission facilities, they will minimize or diminish different Fourier components by different amounts. So they will introduce certain distortion. All the Fourier components, because different frequency will be affected differently. Uh, usually, uh, if you take for a wire, the amplitudes are transmitted mostly unreduced from 0 till certain frequency, some frequency say F sub C. That is, you can just say 0 to some frequency, it will be transmitted. All the frequencies which are above this F sub C will be cut off. Or you can say, you can say above this cutoff frequency will be attenuated. So we are sending certain thing. There is certain frequency range from 0 to say f, but for some of the frequency will be attenuated, only 0 to f will go. So the width of the frequency range which is transmitted without being strongly attenuated is called the bandwidth. I hope you got the idea. We are sending it, but there is certain range only that will go because that will be only possible to go. Other will be attenuated. The bandwidth is this one. The width of the frequency range transmitted without being strongly attenuated is the bandwidth. But in practice, you see this cutoff is not very sharp, which I just explained. It is not very sharp. Actually, the quoted bandwidth, as I said, 0 to frequency, this frequ 0 to frequency, what is that frequency FC? This frequency is at which the received power has fallen by half. This is again a new thing. So let us understand by here. I am trying to show certain diagrams here. And you will know later why this minus 3 dB is there. Because this is where the cutoff happens. This is the cutoff frequency. But right now you just have to understand that in order to determine the bandwidth of the signal, we have 20 log 0 0.707 and 10 log 0 0.5. This is only when we decrease the voltage from maximum to certain percentage, say 0 0.707, that is the 70% max, or decreasing the power from max to half power. Forget about everything, just understand that the quoted frequency, which is the bandwidth from 0 to frequency, and which frequency? The frequency at which the received power has fallen by half. The frequency at which the received power has fallen by half. So this 20 log 0 0.707, these are expression, 10 log 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is for the power to be half. So again, let me reiterate, bandwidth from 0 to that frequency at which the received power has fallen by half. So the bandwidth is a physical property of the transmission medium. It totally depends on the construction, the thickness, length and material of a wire or a fiber. Bandwidth limited signals. So how do we limit the bandwidth? What are the criteria? How, what are the ways? For example, we have a channel. If this is a road, for example. Some work is going on, so we just leave this space. 
So how do we do this? We use filters. So these filters are used to limit the bandwidth of a signal, to further limit the bandwidth of a signal. For example, 802.11 wireless channels. They are generally use roughly 20 megahertz. So we use these filters. So 802.11 radius filter, the signal bandwidth to this 20 megahertz size. This is how this filter works. They further limit the bandwidth of a signal. Let me take one more example. The traditional analog television. These channels occupy around 6 megahertz each. It can be on wire or over the air. 6 megahertz. So again, same thing. The filters will be used so that the 6 megahertz can be used by the channels. So filtering is all about letting the signals, more and more signals, to share the given region of spectrum being assigned. That is how it will improve the overall efficiency. Right? So this filtering is allowing us to use the whole spectrum, improving the efficiency. And now comes the baseband and bandpass signal. So the difference only is that one is centered around zero. One is not centered around zero. One is shifted. So signals that run from zero to maximum frequency, say F max or F C, F sub C. So signal that run from zero to maximum frequency, these are called as base band signal, base band signals. Okay. And those signals which are shifted to occupy a higher range of frequency, for example, in the wireless transmissions, these are called as pass band signals. We are actually shifting it. We are shifting it in order for them to occupy the higher range of frequencies. That is the pass band signal or band pass signal. Let me show you here. This is the base band signal. It is centered around zero. So the spectrum not centered around non-zero frequency, you can see also. So it may have a DC component also. In the pass band or band pass signal, we have shifted it. Shifted with certain carrier frequency, FC. So now it has been shifted. And this is the portion we have shifted. So this FC we have shifted. So this B by 2 and minus B by 2 and B by 2 will be have an additional factor of this FC. Adding and subtracting. So this is the band pass field. Now it is centered around this FC, the shift of carrier FC. One is around zero, one is around some FC. Now let us come again back to this discussion. We wanted to send the bits. These bits, we want, we have converted them into the harmonics. Actually, the Fourier analysis, Fourier coefficients, A, N and B, N. A1, B, B1, A2, B2, like this. And then we squared them. We added them. And then took the underwood. We called them as RMS amplitude. Now, if you are sending one harmonic, if you are using just one harmonic, we are just using N equals 1. Now, let me represent it. Are we able to send this proper signal or say ASCII bit B properly? Let me just write it. Only one one I am writing. Is it representing one one? One. So these are not representing properly. That is, even by naked eyes, it doesn't seem good. Now let us say we we take two harmonics. Now things uh, look quite different. This is one, this is one, and this is also one. Somewhat good. But still, what about this? It is not able to represent properly. So we have to increase the harmonic. Let me go to four harmonics now. N1, N2, N3, N4. Now 1, 1. We have to see the zeros also. So this is 1, 1 is quite good represented. But the zero, I don't think it is represented properly. Because there is, in the below, there is a spike here. It cannot represent a zero. Because it is all about voltages. We are talking about voltages. So let me go one more ahead. Let us take eight harmonics. A1 till A8 we have used. So this is 1, 1, 1. And you have peaks. And those, you can say the crest and troughs. This is 0, this is 0, this is 0. Now, this successive approximation of the original signal, what you saw here. So, the binary signal and its root mean square Fourier amplitudes I showed. And finally, this is the final approximation of the original signal. This is how the bits will be sent in terms of harmonics, which is the actual computer is sending bits to another computer. 
and in between we have analog medium this analog medium is taking it in terms of harmonics you are sending it on an analog channel right we cannot be less uh, handling less harmonics we cannot handle or higher harmonics we have to be very precise i'll give you one more scenario these are the bps bit per second uh, see all things are given bit per rate how many harmonics harmonics we are sending what is the first harmonic for one bit per second what is the time so let us say we have a bit rate of b bits per second what is the time required to send the 8 bits one bit it will be 8 by b second one bit 8 by b second okay now you don't have to worry about these mathematics okay the basic idea i'll just tell you so the frequency will be what it will be the inverted it will be b by 8 hertz so i'll take a proper example here so let us take an example of a ordinary telephone line which is a, also called as a voice grade line so this ordinary telephone line they have already artificially introduced cut off frequency which is just about 3000 hertz so since we have an expression b by 8 hertz the number of highest harmonic pass through will be what with this mathematics a basic mathematics with this 3000 uh, cut off if i use this b by 8 hertz and use the 3000 hertz what is the number of highest harmonic pass through this it will be 24000 by b because it will be 3000 by b by 8 it will go up 8 into 3 is 24 so 24000 by b so this is a, a way, an expression we get 24000 by b okay now let us come to this b b is our bit per second from the table it is quite evident that if you put actual values here let me start with 38400 you can also put 9600 you can put also 1200 so these are all all uh, bps or bit per second so at 38.4 this table is clearly showing that you have harmonic sent as zero so data rates which are higher than 38.4 kbps there is no hope for the binary signals no hope you will not get any binary signals so this is not uh, not acceptable will not go there at 9600 bps also accurate reception of this originally by bi original binary bit stream is also quite tricky so what i'm trying to suggest here is that limiting bandwidth limits the data rate even for the perfect noiseless channels so in order to retrieve the bits which are being sent from one place to another we have to see how many harmonics how many what will be the bit bps and in what way we can retrieve it limiting bandwidth limits the data rate even for the perfect noiseless channels but there are coding schemes using several voltage levels we can achieve higher data rates right this can also be done we'll talk about these coding schemes but if this is also possible okay before uh, uh, i go ahead let me tell about this bandwidth how people see it for electric electrical engineers for computer scientists how do they see this bandwidth for electrical engineers basically they talk in terms of or see in terms of analog the bandwidth is quantity which is measured in hertz that is what they see bandwidth for computer scientists the for they talk in digital so the bandwidth is the maximum data rate of the channel bits per second the maximum data rate of a channel so in any channel wherever the communication is taking place so there is a limit okay that is the data rate or bit per second how much it can send or allow so 1924 an at&t engineer he is harry nyquist he realized that even a channel which is regarded as perfect that also has a finite transmission capacity bit per second or sending rate so nyquist he derived an equation and he derived it for the noiseless channel so he derived an equation and expressing the maximum data rate bit per second 
for a finite bandwidth, especially in noiseless channel. In 1948, Claude Shannon, the he carried out or carried forward Nyquist work and extended it to the case where the channel has noise. For example, random noise, thermodynamic noise, thermal noise. Okay. Nyquist, noiseless channel, Shannon, noise channel or noised thermodynamic thermal channel. So Nyquist proved that if an arbitrary signal, any signal through a low pass filter of bandwidth B, so the bandwidth is decided, this is the bandwidth, capital B. So this can be completely reconstructed by making only 2B exact samples per second. That is one computer sending to another. We need, according to request, the signal can be reconstructed by making only and only that is the exact 2B samples per second. So sampling the line faster than 2B, what does it mean? It is pointless. Why we are not talking about this? Because the higher frequency component that this kind of sampling could recover has already been filtered out. We have already used the uh, filter. So the Nyquist theorem states that for signal of V discrete levels, what is this V? Now the Shannon doesn't have this V discrete levels. So Nyquist theorem, I'll just tell you about the levels. So the maximum data rate will be 2 multiplied by B bandwidth multiplied by log basis 2 of V. V is the discrete levels. So this is the maximum data rate. I'll give you an example of that. So because Nyquist talked about noiseless channels, so let us consider we have a 3 kilohertz channel. Now this 3 kilohertz is the bandwidth, 3 kilohertz. And this channel cannot transmit binary. What is the maximum data rate? Binary means 0, 1. So we are talking about two levels. So this capital V is this level, this discrete level. Here for binary we are using 2. So this 3 kilohertz with 2 level, the maximum data rate is only 6 kbps or 6000 BP, bps bit per second. When it comes to noisy channel, we also call it as Shannon capacity. See, take any object, take anything, there will always be some random noise, thermal noise because there will be molecules, molecules will be in motion and there will be some motion producing heat, very very minute but still it will be there. So there will be a thermal noise, thermodynamic noise and this thermal noise is a measured by the ratio of signal power, let us say S, to the noise power, capital N. That is, the noise is computed as signal to noise ratio, the signal power being sent and the noise present, noise power. So signal, signal to no noise, we also call it as SNR, signal to noise ratio, S by N. So this ratio it can be very large. It can go up to a very high number. So in order for the computation to take place mathematically, we would like to make it in a range so that we can handle it. That is why this kind of ratio in mostly other examples also you will see, this will be expressed on a log scale. So 10, then log, base is also 10 and then we have S by N. As I said, we are trying to mitigate the tremendous range. So the units of this log scale, we call it as decibels, dB. Deci means 10 here. And what is Bell? Bell is for the honor of Alexander Graham Bell, who first patented the telephone system. For example, the signal to noise ratio of 10 is 10 dB. The ratio of S by N, 100, is 20 dB. The ratio of uh, this S by N 1000 will be 30 dB. So this will be easier to compute also and to understand also.
So this is the decibel. We are converting it into a decibel or log scale. So Shannon capacity or Shannon's major result is the maximum data rate or the maximum capacity for a noisy channel. Okay, Nyquist noiseless channel. Claude Shannon noisy channel. So he said or he gave the expression maximum data rate will be bandwidth multiplied by log the base will be 2 1 plus s by n s by n is signal to noise ratio bits per second. So B you will always take in hertz if it is in kilohertz you have to convert it into hertz and the signal to noise ratio s by n this is the maximum data rate. Let us take a real life scenario here. We know the maximum data rate of uh, Claude Shannon. So it depends on what? Bandwidth and signal to noise ratio. So you have in your home normally ADSL, asymmetric digital subscriber line. So this is providing the internet access over the normal telephone lines. And this uses a bandwidth of 1 megahertz. If you take 1 to 2 kilometer short lines, the SNR or signal to noise ratio of 40 dB is quite good for reception. Now it is mentioned that channel can never transmit more than 13 Mbps because we have the maximum data rate capacity. You will see that this, these ADCL will have, an, uh, have a uh, number written 12 Mbps for per se. So in order to improve Either we have to improve the bandwidth or signal to noise ratio. In order to improve the SNR signal to noise ratio, we can put certain uh, digital repeaters. Repeaters enhances the energy, boosts the energy, the signal strength. Or we can use more bandwidth as we have been doing uh, with a new evolution of this ASDL that is ADSL that is the ASDL2 plus. Okay. Digital modulation. See, we are dealing with wires or wireless channels. Now these channels, they carry analog signals. Okay. This can be done using uh, voltage, light intensity, sound intensity. So we can vary it. And then these wires and wireless channels, they can carry the analog signal. So if you want to send the signals on this analog channel. For example, you have bits. You have to send it on, on wire. So how to send these bits on the wire? Wire will have, because this is an electrical component, it will have a voltage, it can have a ampere. If fiber is there, it can be light. Okay. So the only idea is to vary all these and with different voltage, different uh, bits can be sent. So to send a digital information that is 0, 1, 1, 0, like this kind of thing, this kind of binary digits or bits, in order to send this digital information, we have to devise, we must devise analog signals. Th those can represent these bits. For example, we have multiple computers. One computer is sending say 1011 and the other also has to get 1011. But the channel or the, you know, mode are analog. So how to represent this 1011 in terms of sending so that the wire can take this 1011 and the other computer can understand that 1011 has come. So the, this exact process, the process of converting between these bits and signals is called digital modulation. Okay. Let me tell you again. The process of converting the bits, digital bits, binary digits into signals is called digital modulation. So there are various schemes. There are various schemes that converts these bits into signal. And these are called baseband transmission. Baseband transmission. I told you about baseband trans signals. So the schemes that converts bits into signal, baseband transmission. And what is the basic thing? The signal here will occupy frequencies from 0 to certain maximum signaling rate. Let us write it as max. This is the baseband signal. 
very common to the wires, coaxial cable uh, twisted pair, very common baseband transmission for the wires. But there are certain schemes, rather than voltage intensity or sound, uh, light or sound, it can uh, regulate the amplitude, phase and frequency. See, any signal, it will have some amplitude like this, it will have some angle that is the phase and number of oscillation that is the frequency. So there are certain schemes that can regulate, that can, that can modulate, that can change the amplitude, phase and frequency of a carrier signal to convey bits and these are called passband transmission. What are these called? Passband transmission. You know, you understood the difference between baseband transmission and passband transmission. Okay. So these are the schemes we are, we are changing, varying the amplitude, phase and frequency of the carrier signal in order to present the bit, represent the bit. In this passband or band pass transmission, the signal will occupy a band of frequency around a central frequency around the frequency and this frequency will be of the carrier signal, right? So this is the central frequency I am talking about, passband transmission. And this is very common by the wireless and the optical channels, where the signals has to reside in a given frequency band. There is a particular frequency band and the signals have to reside inside this. There is one more concept, multiplexing. Now, there are multiple people who want to use this channel or the road, say. When all these three can go together, so the channels or the road, those share or they are shared by multiple signals. Here we are taking the analogy of people. The channels are shared by multiple signals. This is called multiplexing. In baseband transmission, there are different schemes. The best way or the easiest way, we are talking about voltage. Whenever you touch a, a wire, you will feel some, some current. That is, you have some voltage, some current. So, the most straightforward or straightforward form of digital modulation that is from bits to signals is simply to say positive voltage as one bit or a negative voltage as a zero bit. Okay. We can represent a positive voltage by one bit and a negative voltage by a zero bit. This is the most easiest way. But when you talk about the optical fiber, how do we change it? How do we decipher it? You can say that the presence of light can be regarded as one and the absence of light can be regarded as a zero. So this scheme is nothing but N or Z or non-return to zero. The scheme is called non-return to zero. Okay. So let me just uh, give you idea here. One is for high signal, zero is for low signal. So this is the whole bit, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero. We are saying wherever one is there, we are saying high signal. So let us see all the ones and just put a high there. That is one here. Wherever, wherever one is there, one here, one here. So I am just putting a line wherever one is there. And wherever, wherever there is a low signal, that is zero. The zero, this is also zero. And just combine this. This is non return to zero or N R Z. One high signal, zero low signal. Now, the problem because every scheme has some downside. Because we are discussing about not only the sender, the receiver also has to receive. Same bit sequence has to be received. So, how about sending a lot of zeros, a lot of ones? This problem persists. So, it is difficult to interpret zeros and ones, which is called as a baseline, baseline wander. Okay, so receiver, what it does, it converts this into bits because it has to sample the signal at regular intervals of time, you can say clock. So at every say regular interval of time at every clock pulse, it will try to retrieve 
through sampling the signal. Whenever you send the signal, signal will look different because in between it will uh, lose energy, uh, it will be attenuated, distorted by the ch channel. So you may get some noise at receiver. So in order to decode the bits at the receiver end, the receiver need to map signal samples to the closest possible. If some 4 volt is there, it will say, oh, it may be 1. Okay. So for this NRZ, a positive voltage will be taken as a 1 and the negative voltage will be taken as if 0 has been sent by the sender. But this NRZ is seldom used, is not much used. Therefore, we have considering the different engineering consideration, wire, technologies, all these signs, line codes are there. These are different line codes that better meet these engineering considerations. With this NRZ, non return to zero, the signal, it may cycle between the positive and the negative levels up to every two bits. Just take a case of alternating ones and zeros, zero, one, zero, one like this. So the signal will cycle between the positive and negative levels up to every two bits, right? Now, this means what? We need a bandwidth of at least B by 2 hertz. We need that. What does it mean? When the bit rate is bit B bit per second, we need at least B by 2 hertz. So we cannot run this NRZ faster if we don't have uh, extra bandwidth. So without using additional bandwidth, we cannot use it because I showed you the scenario. But the bandwidth is limited. Even for the wired channels, the bandwidth is not that much freely available. If you want to send the high frequency signal, what will happen? High frequency signals are susceptible to attenuation for the loss. And even we, will, we would require uh, faster electronics for sending the high frequency signals. So there are certain scenarios to be th thought here also. So what is the strategy? The strategy is we can use more than two signaling levels. This we can do. We can use two signaling levels. So before we talk about this, by using the, I'll talk about the bitrate and moderate. So by using the four voltages, for example, we are using four voltage now. We can send two bits at once as a single symbol. That is, these are the combination. So here we have this is, these are different voltages and for every voltage, two bits we are sending and we are call it, calling that we are sending two bits at once as a single symbol. Zero, zero is not one. It is a single symbol. One, one, or zero, one, one, zero. These are one symbol. So the rates at which the signal changes is half the bit rate. Okay. Because we are using two now. So needed bandwidth has been reduced. So rate at which the signal changes is called the symbol rate. Rate at which the single would change, the sing signal will change will be symbol rate and that is called as a baud rate. Baud rate. So sing signal changing rate is baud rate. And what is the bit rate? Bit rate, bit rate, I'll just tell you. I'll give you the difference also. So bit rate is computed how we have to multiply the baud rate with the bits per symbol. For example, here we have, here we have two bits per symbol. Okay. And one thing you need to know that the number of signal levels, they does not need to be a power of two. Bit rate and baud rate. Bit rate is the number of bits that are transferred between devices in one second. We call it as bit rate. You can also call it as the speed. This is the rate at which the data is sent. One second, how many bits are sent? The unit is bit per second. You can also call it as a measurement of speed, bit rate. And baud rate is the number of times a signal in a communication 
channel changes its state okay the changing state of signal is baud rate and the number of bits that are transferred in one second is bit rate so the signal number of time it is changing its state is baud rate i'll give an example okay see here we have 0 0 these are three bits that is the number of bits per signal is three number of bits per signal you see 0 0 1 0 0 0 all these are they are number of bits per signal they are three i am saying that the signal changes say 20 times per second here so the 20 is the baud rate signal is changing 20 times per second that is the baud rate and the number of bits per signal is 3 so how do we get the bit rate the bit rate will be the number of time the signal changes that is the 20 multiplied by the number of bits per signal which is 3 here in this example 60 will be the bit rate that is the bit per second for the baud rate of 20 so here you see two more figure so this has a baud rate of 1 baud and a bit rate of 1 bit per second only 1 bit is going 1 bit per second here you have 2 bit per means you have in a one symbol two bits so baud rate still is one baud but the bit rate is 2 bbp bps one more example here you have three bits i have given a line here and there are combination of 3 3 bits so the bit rate will be simply 3 into n n is what the baud rate similarly if you have quad bit 4 bit 4 bits and baud rate remaining n the bit rate will be 4 into n so the schemes we have discussed all the scheme that encode the bit into symbols or the signals receiver has to know when one symbol is starting and other is ending so that the next symbol begins to correctly decode the bits this is the responsibility of the receiver if you have long series of zeros how can a receiver tell it is it will be difficult to tell the bits apart because there are number of zeros so the only uh, thought is we can have an accurate clock like we have in gps the atomic clock then it can easily tell where the uh, symbol is ending but it is very very expensive so the strategy would be we can send this clock signal using uh, a different uh, channel that is we can send a separate clock signal to the receiver one will be for data one will be for the clock signal So now the sender will know. Sender and receiver will have same clock. It can easily find out where the symbol is standing, where the where, where the symbol is ending. But the problem is, if you are using another clock, why not to use it for the data? Why are you using sim single channel for uh, sending only the clock signal? We can even use it for sending data. So the idea is a clever idea is. we can mix the clock signal with the data signal because the clock can only be you know used to find out where the data is there so we can mix the clock signal with the data signal by using uh, xor we will not need any extra line which we were just we were just discussing to send the clock signal so the clock will make a, or the clock makes a clock transition in every bit time so it will run at twice the bit rate because the clock is making a clock transition in every bit time and since we have xor the clock signal with the data signal xor you can see on the right i have shown you the truth table so when the it is xor with a zero level when we have zero zero it will give you one when we have one one it will give you one if they are different zero one one zero you, you will get a zero so when xor with a zero level it makes a low to high transition that is simply the clock 
Okay. So the transition can be termed as a logical zero. When it is XORed with a one level, it will be inverted. And now it will make a high to low transition. So the transition is a logical one. Logical one here. What I am trying to suggest here is that whenever you see a zero, it will be like this. Whenever it will be one, it will be like this. The whole story is this. So you see here, whenever we have zero, it is going like this. Whenever we have one, it is going like this. Take it anyway. One, it is going like this. Again, we have one. Then we have zero, so it is going down. So this scheme is called Manchester encoding. This scheme is called as Manchester encoding, and this was used for classic Ethernet. But what are what is the downside of the Manchester coding? As I said, it requires twice bandwidth as the NRZ because it has a clock also, and we were. Exploring it also, so there can be different strategy thoughts. We could, uh, uh, we should uh, code data to ensure that there are enough transition in the signal. We can code the data itself. That is coding a one as a transition and a zero when there is no transition or a vice versa. So this kind of coding is called NRZI or non-return to zero inverted. Non return to zero inverted. Here it is an example. What you have to do is wherever you see a transition from zero to one or one is there, make a transition. Wherever it is zero, just make a straight line. Now you get a one translated. Make a transition. Again one, make a transition. Zero, keep it straight. Again one, make a transition. This is called NRZI. In universal serial bus USB. This standard for connecting computer peripherals they use NRZI. Now, in order to fix this long runs of zeros, what we can do? We have multiple solution. We can uh, divide or break up these long runs of zeros. It can be fifty, forty, twenty zeros. We can divide these say twenty zeros into five five zeros or four four zeros. This can be a solution. So the strategy of this. There is a well-known code to do this: is 4B and 5B, probably 5B. What does it do? The 4-bit, every 4-bit is mapped to a 5-bit pattern, and there will be a fixed transition table. 4-bit is 2 to the power 4, so 16 combination. 5-bit is 2 to the power 5, that is 32 combination of zeros one. So now we are mapping the 4-bit to 5-bit. And there will be a fixed transition table that that you see here also. That is zero 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 four zeros will be having code word as one 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 zero. Okay, this is four B five B table transition table. What you will get? What is the benefit? You will never have more than three consecutive zeros. Say you take these two zeros. In the end, you will have maximum two zeros, and in the front you have, will have one zero. So if you combine this end and front, there will be maximum three zeros. These zero, these two zeros, and this one zero. Any any combination you can take. So there will never be a run of more than three consecutive zeros. So this is how we fix the long runs of zeros problem. But this kind of four B five B screen, because there is a transition table, there will be a twenty five percent overhead. But it is hundred percent better than means the Manchester encoding is having hundred percent overhead. But more thing. Because sixteen input is there and thirty-two output combination are there, so some of the output combination are not used because sixteen only will be utilized. Sixteen will be free to us, so we can use this sixteen for other use. We can use these non-data codes to represent the physical layer control signals. For example, in these two columns, you see there is node one 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 one. You will not also see one one zero zero zero. So we can use. This as idle line, and the other one as the start of a frame. There is another alternative approach in order to make the data look random. 
we don't want a series of zeros, series of ones. So here we have scrambling. For example, scrambled egg you eat and you don't know which part has gone where. So this scrambler, how does it work? This word by XORing, that is using the XOR uh, operation. So XORing data with the pseudo random sequence before transmission. Random means just if you say random 10 numbers, so sometimes 1 can come, 10 can come, 9 can come. Pseudo random is random number will come, but there will be some st statistical or background thought. So that uh, data will be XOR, okay, before transmission. And receiver will again at the receiver end will XOR the incoming bits with the same pseudo random sequence which was uh, taken by the sender in order to recover the real data. So scrambling is quite attractive because it adds no bandwidth and there is no time overhead as well. One more thing in scrambling is it helps. Why? Because random signals tend to be white. What does it mean white? That is these signals have energy. They are spread across the frequency components. Okay. That is why we are calling it as white. But if the data are the same as the pseudo random sequence, data and pseudo random sequence are same, XOR operation will give you all zeros. This also we have to see. Uh, this has happened earlier version of the standards for the for sending these IP packets over sonnet links in the telephone system had this defect. Balanced signals, bipolar AMI encoding. What is balancing? Balancing means positive and negative voltage equally. That is a proper mix of positive and negative voltages. So this balancing helps to provide transition for clock re recovery because there is a mix of positive and negative voltage. If the signal is unbalanced, that is more positive or more negative, average may drift away from the true decision level. There may be densities of one, right? For example, this unbalanced signal may cause more symbol to be decoded with errors. So the balanced code, what do we do? We use two voltages to represent one and zero. In a balanced code where is a where there is a proper mix of positive and negative voltages, we use two voltage levels. For example, the plus one volt we are using say for one bit and a negative one voltage for zero bit. This is how it will be balanced also and we will be able to represent a 1 and 0. In order to send a word, for example, the transmitter will alternate between the positive value and negative value. That is the plus 1 here and negative 1 voltage levels. So that because of the balancing, they always averages out. Okay. So this is alternating. The transmitter will alternate between plus 1 and minus 1. And this scheme is called bipolar encoding. If you talk about telephone network, it is called as AMI or alternate mark inversion. Bipolar encoding in telephone network is AMI and in AMI alternate mark inversion, one will be called as mark and zero will be called as a space. How does it work? See, zero we are going straight, one there is a height. Then zero again, we go like that. But again, one is coming. So we alternate. We don't go up. We go down. That is plus one was there. Now we are going to negative one. Again, there is an inversion because one is coming. So we have to invert it. Then one again, we are going down and then zero it's straight. So this is bipolar AMI encoding. Bipolar encoding or all these encoding we are discussing, it's add, it adds a voltage level because in order to achieve a balance, there has to be some voltage level to be added as done in bipolar encoding. We don't want more ones or more zeros. So we can use a mapping like 4B and 5B to achieve this balance. We have already seen this. Okay. This will help in a transition for 
uh, clock recovery also. So here we can use 8B and 10B. So 8B, 10B line code, how does it work? 8B, 10B, the 8 bits of input, they are mapped to 10 bits of output. 8 bits of input in 8B, 10B, 8 bit is the input and 10 bits are the output, so they are mapped. The 8 bits, how does it work? See, there is 8 bit. So this 8 bit, they are split into 5 bit, a group of 5 bit and a group of 3 bit. This first 5 bit will be mapped to 6 bits and this, the next 3 bit will be mapped to a 4 bit. And this 6 and 4 will then be concatenated or they will be combined. So in each group, some input patterns, they can be mapped to balance the out patterns, output patterns that have the same numbers of zeros and ones because this is all about balancing, right? That is why we are using 8B, 10B. For example, 0001 is mapped to 1001. 001, we have two zeros and one one. So it is not balanced. But we have mapped it in 8B, 10B to 1001. Two ones, two zeros. So it is balanced now. That is why we are using 8B and 10B for balancing. But since uh, we don't have enough combination for all the output patterns in order to balance it, because we need equal number of ones and zeros. So uh, each input pattern will be mapped in this scheme to two output patterns. One will have an extra one and the alternate will have an extra zero. So there will be two alternates. I'll show you an example. Now you see here, this is the map. Zero, zero, zero is mapped to two. That is one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one and zero, one, zero, zero. Now, since we have mapped it to two and what are these two? These are two, but they are, these are two, nothing but the other one is the complement of other. That is 0, 1, 0, 0 is there because 0, 0 is mapped to two, two values. And this 0, 1, 0, 0 is nothing but the complement of 1, 0, 1, 1. So which one will be used? Your question will be 1, 0, 1, 1 will be used or 0, 1, 0, 0 will be used. This will be assigned. How? Because as the input bits are mapped to the output bit, bits, the encoder will remember, will recall the disparity from the previous symbol. Now you will ask question, what is disparity? Disparity is the total number of zeros and ones by which the signal is out of balance. You just need to calculate or compute how many ones are there, how many zeros are there. Take the difference, you will know that, oh, this one, there are ones higher, there are zeros more. Okay? So if you, you have two and three, you just take some subtraction one so one is out of balance one one is out of balance if there are two ones and three ones so the encoder will select either an, an pattern output pattern or the alternate it may use one zero one one for zero 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 or it may use zero one zero zero for zero 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 i hope you got the idea because it has to reduce the disparity with this 8b and 10b this disparity will be at most two bits that is the signal will always be balanced and there will be never, never ever more than five consecutive ones or zeros. If you take any combination, put them in any way, you will not get more than ones, five ones or five zeros. Pass band transmission. So in order uh, for the wired transmission, the communication over these baseband frequencies are most appropriate. For example, the twisted K pair, the coaxial cable or the fiber. So the, for these wired transmission, communication over baseband frequencies are mostly used. But when you go to wireless networks and the radio transmission, here we use a range of frequencies because here uh, they will not start with zero. Okay. So there will be, there, there will not be baseband fre uh, frequencies here. Or for wireless channels, when you are using different frequencies, the antenna size will be different. Because if you are using very low frequency signals, the antenna size will be impractical to be made. Because the antenna needs to be a fraction 
of the signal wavelength. Now, how do we prove it? Let us take an example because the antenna sizes of the idea of uh, these uh, frequency. So, wavelength and frequency. Now, let me tell you that which becomes large at higher frequencies. Okay. Now, we have an example here. We have a frequency 15 kilohertz. Now, with all the calculation, the lambda equal to C equal to mu lambda and lambda by 4, the size of the antenna becomes 5 kilometers. So, this is just to give you an idea that the 15 kilohertz frequency will, will want you to have an antenna of 5 kilometer. Even for the wires, when I'm talking about uh, uh, wire also, placing a signal in a, in a particular frequency band is useful because that will allow different kind of signals that can coexist in the channel. Pass band transmission. So, pass band transmission is all about arbitrary band of frequencies, different bands of frequencies, band means the range of frequencies which is used to pass the signal. So, the frequency band can be anything, this can be a band, this can be a band. So, that is why we are saying arbitrary different band of frequencies which are used to pass the signal. This is the pass band transmission. It is a range. It is arbitrary band means different band, different frequencies and different range. These are used to pass the signal. So, what we can do is, the best way is to take up as baseband signal. We know that it goes from 0 to some uh, B hertz, B is the B is the bandwidth and you can shift it up to uh, some, you can shift it to S, shift by S. So, when you shift it by S, the pass band of S that is, it will become now, when you shift it from S, just add S. So, S till S plus B, it will, without, you because you are not changing uh, the amount of information it can carry. You have just shifted this baseband signal. But the signal might look different. What will happen at the receiver end? We can shift this back, what we have shifted to S plus B. Again, we can shift it back to B. That is, again to 0 to B. Back to the baseband. And in this base where it is more convenient to detect the signals. It is very easy and convenient to detect signals. That is why we are shifting it back. This can be done. So, the digital modulation, digital modulation, because uh, in pass band transmission, that is digital modulation is accomplished with this pass band transmission by modulating the carrier signal, the carrier signal that sits in the pass band. So, the modulation is all about bits to signals and signals or to bits to analog signals and then back. So, we can modulate or change the carrier signal that sits in this pass band. This is how pass band transmission, digital modulation, modulation is done. So, what I am trying to suggest here is we can modulate either the amplitude, the frequency or the phase of the carrier signal these are all the properties of any wave carrier signal. So, the amplitude change, frequency change or phase change or variation, this can be employed for actual digital modulation, right? ASK or amplitude shift keying. Here, the way of digital modulation Two binary values are represented, that is may be 0 or 1, they are represented by different amplitudes of the carrier frequencies. What is the amplitude? Amplitude is the distance from the, from the base level, how high the trough is or the crest is. So, the amplitude for 0 can be like this and for 1 it can be like this. So, the change in amplitude will reference different bits, different binary values. Okay, so changing the amplitude, we can represent different binary values. Okay, uh, the problem here is in ASK, it is quite susceptible to noise, and people regard it as not that efficient modulation technique. And this is used for up to 1200 bit per second on the voice grade lines, that is the telephone lines call, and very high speeds over optical fiber. ASK. Let me tell you more about this. 
This is your bit stream. The main idea we are trying to modulate. We are changing this bits to signals. So this is the carrier wave. It has a frequency. It has an amplitude. It has a phase. So how to represent it using the amplitude? So wherever you see one here, only that will be output. Wherever you zero, you are seeing here, there will be no amplitude. You can say amplitude is zero. You can even reduce the amplitude. That can be done. But here you see, see no zero, no amplitude. In everywhere one you see, you will see the same uh, wave. Zero, you will not say any wave. That is the amplitude will decide. This is the amplitude shift keying. So in amplitude shift keying, two different amplitudes are used to represent zero and one. More than two levels can be used to encode multiple bits also per symbol. For example, in one symbol, you can say send zero zero. You can send zero one zero like this. FSK or frequency shift keying. FSK. This is also a digital modulation technique. So here we have carrier wave and the frequency of the carrier signal or wave is varied or chained to represent binary 1 or 0. One frequency will show 1, the different frequency will show 0. Both peak amplitude and the phase will remain constant. Only we are talking about frequency changes here. The frequency of the signal during each bit duration will be constant. It may, may represent a 0, it may represent a 1. Frequency is what? Number of oscillations per second. For example, this is the range. Now I can make a wave like this. In the same range, I can show the wave like this. So one is having the low frequency, the other one is having a high frequency. So one may represent say 0, the other may represent a 1. Now see here, you have the amplitude and phase are not changed, but when you have a 1, the frequency is higher, the number of oscillation or the number of waves are higher. So all these higher frequencies will represent a 1, but when it comes to 0, the frequency is less, it will represent a 0. So the frequency shift keying, two or more different tones are used. You can also say frequency or tones. So now you see a picture here. This is again an example. This is a bit stream. Now we have two carrier waves, high frequency carrier wave. This is very high frequency. Number of oscillations are higher and the low frequency carrier wave. Number of oscillations per second are less. When you do the FSK, the whenever one will be shown, high frequency will be shown. Whenever zero is there, the low frequency will be shown or will be sent to the receiver. And that is how it, it deciphers it. Phase shift keying, PSK. Phase means angle. So when we change the angle of a wave and then represent 0 or 1 bits, binary digits, this is called PSK or phase shift keying. In phase shift keying, the phase of the carrier wave is varied, changed to re represent two or more different signal elements. Remember, the amplitude and frequency will remain same. If you're talking about binary PSK, we will have only two signal elements. One signal element with a phase of zero, angle of zero. The other one will have a phase of 180 degree. Let me show you. This is the Cartesian coordinate system. You are already aware of it. Now a line x-axis, if you make a line on x-axis, that will make an angle zero with the x-axis. But a line which is opposite to the x-axis will make an angle of 180 degree with the x-axis. So the first one can be made to represent a zero. The second one can be made to represent a one. So this is a constellation diagram. You'll see it in QAM 16, QAM 64. So bit zero will have a phase of zero. The receiver, whenever it will have a get a phase of zero, will say zero. If it gets a carrier wave with phase 180 degree, it will regard it as 1. So phase shift keying, the carrier waves, wave is shifted 0 or 180 degree degrees at each symbol period. And because we have two phases here, it is called as BPSK or binary phase shift keying. So binary we are referring to the two symbols, not that the symbol represents the two bits. Okay.
so these are psk and bpsk but there are better schemes also there are better scheme like qpsk but let, first let me tell you about this now if you want to send a one it is like this but whenever you want to send a zero there will be a phase shift you see there is a phase shift of 180 degree so this is how zero will be represented again you have a one after that so there will be a phase shift this is a phase shift again you go but from one to one there will be no phase shift again from one to zero there will be a phase shift zero and 180 degree so this is how one and zero will be represented so i was telling you about the qpsk now again going to the cartesian coordinate system so zero and 180 degree we saw now let us make a line here in between we will be we can represent four angles because the waves have different angles 0 to 360 degree so you can represent four 45 degrees from x axis this is angle is 135 degree this angle from positive x axis is 225 and this angle whole angle is 315 degree now this scheme is qpsk we are using four different angles that is these are one can be used for 0 0 second can be 0 1 third can be 1 0 fourth can be 1 1 so this qpsk is quadrature phase shift keying that uses the channel bandwidth efficiently to use four shifts four angles 45 degree 135 degree 225 degree 350 degree and here we are transmitting two bits of information per signal okay binary 2 quadrature 4 in binary we can send only 0 1 in quadrature we can send 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 we can combine this ASK FSK and PSK amplitude shift keying phase shift keying and frequency shift keying these schemes can be combined and we can use more levels to transmit more bits per semi that is not only 0 1 but 0 0 1 1 or 0 0 0 0 1 like this see frequency and phase they are related so only one of them either frequency or phase can be modulated at a time because they are related because frequency is nothing but the rate of change of phase over time so either you can take phase or frequency let us say we are taking phase so the amplitude and the phase these are modulated in combination you you know why we are not frequency using frequency because only one can be taken but phase is uh, this amplitude is different so is in this figure if you see we have four dots these four dots are equidistant and at an angle of 45 degree from the positive x axis this is 45 degree what is the angle of this second one on the second quadrant it's 135 degree in the third quadrant 225 degree fourth quadrant 315 degree so now we can represent four four uh, symbols so that symbol can be two bits because two to the two to the power two is four okay so the phase of a dot is indicated by the angle a line from it to the origin make it with the positive x-axis the phase is like this the amplitude of the dot is the distance from the origin now this kind of diagram you see dotted dotted diagram this is called a constellation diagram so now in a you see four dots in b you see how many dots 14 so as i said here 2 to the power 2 is 4 so in at the same time you can send two bits per symbol 0 0 0 1 1 1 1 0 in this 2 to the power 4 is 16 you can send four bit at a time per symbol like 0 1 0 0 you can send 1 1 1 0 you can send 16 combinations are there so 16 combination not only about phase but we are combining the amplitude and the phase are used here so the modulation scheme can be used to transmit four bits per symbol four bit okay this is called as qam16 or quadrature amplitude modulation QAM16. How does it work? See here. Now let us say we have A as some distance. A can be 1 by root 10. So once we want to send 0101, 1, 1, what is the angle? 45 degree. 
So the phase will be 45. As I said, we are taking the combination of phase and amplitude. What will be the amplitude? The amplitude will be the distance of 0, 1, 0, 1 dot from the origin. Let us say it is A. Okay. So once we want to send 0, 1, 0, 1, this will be like this. Now we want to send say 0, 0, 1, 0. What will be the angle? What will be the phase? The phase will be now, let me just join it. From positive x-axis, it is 135 degree. So it will be 135 degree. And amplitude can be, you can take the distance. It can be say 3, taking an example. So these are the combination for every bit there, for every bit combination, for bit combination, there will be a proper uh, pair of phase and amplitude. This is called QM16. Now the third figure you see. This figure is more denser. First one was having 4, then 16, then we have 2 to the power 6, which is 64 dots. So we can have 64 different combination of amplitude and phase. Now we can say send 6 bits per symbol. This bit combination, one of the combination I said. This is called as QAM64, quadrature amplitude modulation 64. 6 bits can be transmitted per symbol because we have 64 different combination of amplitude and phase. Amplitude, distance from the origin, phase is the angle from the positive x-axis. Okay. Now, how do we assign the base? You, you can say how these bits are being assigned. Why we have 1111 one, one, one here, 1011 one, one there? Why can't we have some other combination? Okay. You can have 1000 zero, zero, zero at the top. Why can't you have it in the third quarter? The main argument is, the important consideration is that a small burst of noise at the receiver may not lead to many bit errors. So assigning consecutive bit values to adjacent symbols, that is what we do. For example, in uh, say QAM16, let us take the example of the second figure. If one symbol, say it is a 0, 1, 1, 1, and the neighboring symbol is, for example, 1, triple 0. If the receiver mistakenly pick the adjacent symbol, the whole bit sequence will be wrong. So the solution is, we assign the adjacent symbol so that they only differ by one bit. That is the gray code. Gray code is when two, two combinations, they only differ by one bit position. That is called the gray code. So you see here, we have an example. This figure shows QAM16 constellation gray coded. Now these combinations all have only one bit as differ by one bit gray coded. Okay. Now, if the receiver decodes the symbol in error, it will make only a single bit error because of the gray code. Multiplexing in uh, digital communication, or computer networks, what happens that uh, it costs same amount of money even if you want to install and maintain the high bandwidth transmission line or a low bandwidth transmission line because the cost come from you are actually uh, digging a trench. So the amount is same almost. That is how when you have a line being laid Multiples uh, or multiplexing schemes, these were developed to share lines among many signals. That is, what you have laid once, may it be possible to send the data by multiplexing and sharing the lines. So we will see the multiplexing because we are talking about a single physical line. How to multiplex, there are multiple ways. You can use time, frequency, or code. Then we'll also talk about the WDM or wavelength division multiplexing. This is an optical form of FDM or frequency division multiplexing. So you have to understand FDM, uh, then you will be able to understand WDM quickly. So before we go ahead discussing all these, multiplexing in digital communication on computer networks we have two types, analog and digital. In analog, because analog digital, analog, the FDM 
frequency division multiplexing and WDM because WDM is just like MDM. They are analog multiplexing techniques or schemes. Frequency division multiplexing, wavelength division multiplexing, analog way of multiplexing, digital time division multiplexing. So TDM is a type of digital multiplexing technique and we will talk about two types synchronous and asynchronous that is the statistical TDM, statistical on demand TDM. FDM or frequency division multiplexing. Multiplexing means we want a single channel where you can send multiple signals. So this what you can do, you have a channel, you can divide it into multiple parts. You say first signal go by this way, second uh, assigned to you, now you go by this way, likewise. So once you can just combine and send it. So this is a analog technique FDM and this can be applied when the bandwidth of the link is greater than the combined bandwidth of the signal to be transmitted. That is if you want to send say three signals, if you combine the bandwidth or the uh, com individual uh, you just combine, this should be less than the actual bandwidth available, then only FDM will work. Okay. So the channel frequency has to be higher than the individual frequency that are need, that are going to be FDM multiplexed. So for FDM frequency division multiplexing, it takes the advantage of the band pass or pass band transmission to share a channel. You know that you know that pass band where we shift the frequency from the base band so that we have no the, the signals are not centered around a centered zero frequency. So there will be a proper frequency on that will be the central frequency. So it divides the spectrum into frequency bands, each user having exclusive possession of some band in which to send a signal. That is, for example, this is the whole channel. We divide it. One of the signal will be given the dedicated part. This is assigned to you. The second signal will be assigned second uh, band or the this is how the channel will be divided and exclusive position will be there. I'll give an example of AM. You know about the radio transmission. The AM radio broadcasting is using the FDM. For example, the allocated spectrum from the boundary is around 1 megahertz. That is roughly around 500 to 1500 kilohertz. So this is total is, uh, for example, we are taking AM 1 megahertz. 500 to 1500 kilohertz. Now multiple stations are there. So different frequencies are allocated to different logical channels or the stations. For example, one can be LA station, one can be some Wisconsin station, one can be some other, say Washington. So these are the st different stations and they are allocated different logical channels, different frequencies are allocated like this, each operating in a portion of the spectrum. And here very important part is the inter channel separation. For example, if you, you have to a two house combined, there will always be a trouble, interference. If the houses are apart, there will be no problem or less problem. So here we, when we are, dis, we are dividing the frequency and assigning it, we have the inter-channel separation. This has to be great enough because we don't want any kind of interference between two adjacent frequency bands. Okay. So there are filters. It can limit the usable bandwidth, say for a voice, voice grade channel. It can be uh, 3100 hertz. So voice grade channel, I'm talking about the telephone communication. Now this is 3100, I'm taking one more example actually. So this is 3100 hertz. When various channels or many channels are multiplexed, 4000 hertz is allocated per channel. Now you will feel the difference 3100, 3100 and 4000. What is the difference? Around 900 uh, hertz. Why this is there? Because this has to be there for preventing the, the interference among the adjacent band. This excess bandwidth is called a guard band. This is a guard band. This is necessary in FDM. Otherwise, there will be interference. Therefore, when you tune, you will see you have to tune a little bit so that the next station can come. So first these voice channels, 
they are raised in frequency shifted in frequency each by some different amount and then they will be combined because no two channels now occupy the same portion of the spectrum because every channel is assigned certain frequency which are different from other but uh, there will still be some overlap because the we are using filters the real filters will not have ideal sharp edges there will be some so here is an example of three voice grade telephone channels they are multiplex using the fdm so how does it work let us see here the first figure that is the a1 is the original bandwidth channel 1 channel 1 two, channel 2 channel 3 now the bandwidth are raised in frequency that is you can say we have made it shift we have shifted it so first one is shifted by a little bit the second this this is the this is the shifting i am talking about and this is the only bandwidth raising in frequency second one like this third one we shifted it uh, a little, little bit more or you can say we have raised the frequency each by different amount and now we are multiplexing it so you now you see these three channels channel 1 channel 2 channel 3 how do they look this is the multiplex channel you see here and here is 60 to 64 you see channel 1 64 to 68 uh, channel 2 and 68 to 72 it's channel 3 so this is the whole procedure you are dividing the whole spectrum different frequencies and allowing multiple channels to to use that frequency with a guard band OFDM or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing so frequency division multiplexing we had a channel allocated to us on a spectrum so we divided that particular bandwidth into multiple parts and we allowed different station and allocated them permanently that they can send they can transmit in that frequency okay for example one channel from uh, say la once one is coming from even different uh, part of the, the state so this was frequency division multiplexing orthogonal frequency division multiplexing the carrier centers are put on orthogonal frequency orthogonal means let me give you an anal analogy this is the cartesian coordinate system you can say 3d coordinate system so x is orthogonal with z x is orthogonal with y and y is orthogonal with z so we can have x y z together though they are orthogonal so same thing we are doing here we are taking multiple frequencies and we are arranging them in a way so that they are orthogonal perpendicular or not interfering with each other but still we have press those frequency so that they exist together right so just assume that we have uh, just say that you have two hands and then th there are fre frequencies in between three or four and then you just press it bring your hand together this is how you do it so the peak of the first wherever there is a peak of first there will be zero for others the peak of the second there will be zero for others that is the other frequencies will not be interfering with the frequencies in as a subject or in question okay so the peak of each signal will coincide with the zero crossing of all other signals that is how we achieve the orthogonality so carrier centers are put on orthogonal frequency the subcarriers are spaced by one by t that is the delta f frequency or you can say frequency is again 1 by t so if you see here this is a green signal and you you just see about blue and uh, red where are they when the green is peaking the red and blue they are zero when the red is peaking the other two are zero so when sending the digital data it is possible to divide the spectrum efficiently without the guard band because in FDM or frequency division multiplexing we have to give some part to the guard band and that is the wastage of that particular frequency being allot allocated so here we are dividing the spectrum efficiently in OFDM orthogonal frequency division multiplexing the channel bandwidth is divided into many carrier subcarriers you see different colors here that independently send data 
For example, you have already seen in quadrature amplitude modulation. This is how it is done. So let me tell you again, the orthogonality is the key. One signal, other will be orthogonal to it. So the subcarriers are packed tightly together. As I just said, in the frequency domain, we just imagine about pushing all these together. So these signals or the signal from each subcarrier extend into adjacent ones. That is the one frequency, you can say one wave, the other will be properly, uh, the will be contributing or will be in figure, you will see they are crossing each other. So the frequency response of each subcarrier is designed so that the zero at the center of the, of the adjacent subcarrier, other will be at zero when one will be peaking. So the subcarriers can therefore be sampled at their central frequencies because others are not interfering, the neighbors are not interfering. But still we need to have a guard time. I am not saying the guard bands will be there, but a guard time is surely needed to repeat the portion of the symbol signals in time so that they have the desired required frequency response. Because now these are packed together and this OFDM, we are using 4G, it is used there. So OFDM is used in 802.11, this is the wireless LAN standard, cable networks, power line networking and the 4G, 4 generation cellular system, OFDM. TDM or time division multiplexing. Just assume there are four people in a room. Everyone is assigned 15 minutes. You have 60, 60 minutes or one hour. Everyone is allowed to speak for 15 minutes. When one is speaking, the other has to be quiet. Time division multiplexing is like this. The time is permanently allocated to different station. And that, that time, only one station will be transmitting. And this goes in the round robin fashion. That is one time one station will be using all the frequency band to transmit. And next time the second station will send, others will not. So user will take turns in a round robin fashion, each one periodically getting the whole bandwidth, entire spectrum for a certain time interval. So bits from each input stream are taken in a fixed time slot that is fixed and output to the aggregate stream. So small intervals of God time which is analogous to what we have seen in the frequency God band may be added to accommodate small timing variation because you know timing can be an issue. TDM is a widely used technique in telephone and cellular network, digital telephony, data communication, satellite access cellular radio is used. Now how it is actually done? See we have four stations. One A means A, B, C, D. Here also you see. This is the colored one. Now multiplexer will combine all these. Means it will take four and output only one. Now how does it work? First, the time is allocated to D. So now for a particular time only D will send. Others cannot send, other will not send for a particular time. Once D time slot is over, then C will be given particular time, the, the same time D has been allocated. So now C will get the whole channel for a particular time, it will send. Now the time will come for B and then the time will come for it. Again D will come, that is the round robin. Again D will come. Then C time allocated, then B allocated, then A allocated. So that is, this is the round row, this is the round robin. The sequence will remain same. The A, B, C, D combination will not be there. Always D, C, B, A, D, C, B, A, D, C, B, A and all D, C, B, A will have equal time and they will be using the whole channel for the that particular time. Statistical TDM. This is asynchronous TDM. Statistical time division multiplexing. So individual streams contribute to the multiplex stream not on a fixed schedule as it was done in TDM but according to the statistics of their demand. 
in tedium if the seat is vacant nobody no one else can sit because it is being set or reserved for someone else okay in statistical or you can say a stadium if someone is asking and the channel is free or the time slot no one else is sending it will be given the chance okay you can come and send in traditional tedium you see here a b is sending but the time slot are located to c and d they are not sending so you can say these are the empty slots so a and b can send but in statistical tedium whenever c and d will the time slot will come a and b will again be assigned okay you can also send but you can send in a b your time also and in the time of c and d also so basically it depends all on demand say if b is asking b will be given the time c says oh i want 3 so it will be given 3 slots then a b comes oh i just want to send b will be given time then a will come oh i want to uh, i want to send 2 so it will be given 2 slots so in statistical tedium slots are dynamically allocated to improve the bandwidth efficiency which was not there in the traditional tedium in the synchronous tedium as a, this this is the actual tedium some slots are empty because the corresponding line does not have data to send the station is not sending this the channel is free you want efficiency so in statistical tedium no slot is left empty as long as there are uh, there is data to be sent by any input line any input line a b c whichever comes it will be allocated because this is the statistics of their demand not a fixed schedule not a round robin cdma or code division multiple access we want to use the same channel to send multiple signals at a time so this is a multiplexing scheme but it is quite different from other multiple the schemes which we have seen here we have a code very important aspect in this code division multiplexing the first word is a code so code division multiplexing is a form of spread spectrum communication spread spectrum means all the spectrum will be used by all the signals all the time so this is a form of spread spectrum communication in which a narrow band signal is spread out over a wider frequency band this cdma is more tolerant to interference as compared to other schemes and multiple signals they share the same frequency band so each station each signal will transmit over entire frequency entire frequency and all the time that is this signal will use whole frequency band or the spectrum allocated and all the time the only difference is the coding theory so time it will get frequency it will get every signal every time the key difference is the code how does it work let me give you a real life example just imagine a, an airport lounge with different people conversing let us say two people are conversing many pairs are conversing they have different ethnicity they have the different languages when we talk about the time division multiplexing you can assume that the pairs of people that is two people at a time they are talking in turns that is when two people are talking others are not talking then the other will get the time likewise then we have fdm frequency division multiplexing you can imagine now the people or now the pairs are talking in different tone different pitches some are talking in high pitched uh, say some are low pitched talking when we are discussing the cdma every pair is talking at once everyone is talking but in a different language one is talking in chinese then french then hindi or urdu so the key to cdma is to be able to extract the desired signal because multiple signals are being sent on the channel so the receiver must 
extract the required signal, desired signal and reject every other signal as a random noise. This is CDMA. So we will use the special code. Every station will get a special code and this code will be generated by or they are called as Walsh codes which are orthogonal combination of ones and zeros. We will call them as chip sequence, chip pattern and chip duration is much shorter than the symbol period. Let me tell you again, all users send and receive data at the same time at the same frequency, but in codes. In CDMA, each bit time is divided into M short interval called chips. Each bit time into M short interval, which are multiplied against the original data sequence. Let us say we have a station. We give it a proper unique code sequence, chip sequence. Let us say a four chip sequence, four bit chip sequence is like this. I'm taking any arbitrary value. I'll tell you why this one, one minus one has come. This one minus one has come from the Walsh coding. The data may be say negative one plus one. Okay. Negative one or zero. Sorry. The data can be one, negative one, zero. What do you want to say? What bit you have said? Okay. So the inversion will send zero. The actual bit sequence will send one. Typically there are 64 to 128 chips per bit, but for simplicity, uh, we will stick to eight bit. We'll take one more example that will have these four bits and we'll take the whole, whole sequence of step. But in order to understand, we are taking right now eight chips per bit. So each station, as I said, will be assigned a very unique M bit code, which you see here also is called a chip sequence. And the codes, if you see, they're only represented by a negative one or a plus one. Every code will be either negative one or plus one. So in order to send a one bit, the station will do what? It will send the chip sequence being assigned to that uh, code because if negative one, 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 one is there, it will send the same sequence. If a station wants to transmit a one. Okay. Now what about zero? If a zero bit has to be transferred, the same chip sequence will be complemented or the negation of this chip sequence will be done. Just multiply everything with a negative one. That is take the complement. So in order to build, send a one bit, the original chip sequence, zero, the negation. As I'm saying, we are just taking the eight chips per bit. So let us take a station A is sending some chip sequence. Now here I'm showing you the four, not four, but the eight bit chip sequence. As I said, it can go up to 64, 128. So if the station want to send a one, it will send the same chip bit, uh, sequence. But if a station want to send a zero, it will just negate it. That is complemented. You see, both the, these chip sequence are nothing but the complement of each other. But I am trying to suggest to you that these are not the bit sequence. They are voltage levels. That is the plus one volt and negative one volt, for example. So actually in, in your mind, you have to keep that you are sending the voltages. Here we have four stations and eight bit per chip sequence has been given. And you know, these chip, this chip sequence has come from Walsh code. Now increasing the amount uh, to be sent from say B bits per second to M times, that is the M B chips per second for each station that A, B, C, D we are uh, uh, signifying for each station means that the bandwidth needed for CDMA is a factor or is greater by a factor of M than the bandwidth which are not uh, those stations not using CDMA. For example, if we have a one megahertz band available for hundred stations, one megahertz for 100 session. If you are using the FDM or frequency division multiplexing, each one would have 10 kilohertz. That is, you are going to divide the frequency. And then, then this could be uh, able, every station will be able to send at 10 kbps, assuming the one bit per hertz is there. When you're using the CDMA, code division multiplex access, each station is going to use whole of one megahertz 
full one megahertz. So the chip rate is hundred chips per bit. To spread the station bit rate of ten kbps across the channel, across the channel, every channel is going to every station will use all one megahertz. So in the chip sequence ABCD, uh, we have assigned to four example stations and the signals that they rep represent. These are eight bit per chip, eight bit per chip sequence, arbitrary chip sequence we have given, but these will have a special property. Two station will not have the same chip sequence. Each station has its own unique chip sequence. Okay, S1, S2, S3, S4. These are four station. A, B, C, D are the chip sequence. Let us say S is the M chip vector for station S. S dash is negation. So when it will send plus one, it will send the say A is sending. When it is sending zero, it will send the negation. As I said, all chip sequences are pairwise orthogonal. That is, the inner product of any two chip se sequence S and T will be S dot T equals zero. What does it mean? Let us take A and B. Negative into one into negative one, one. Negative one into negative one, one. Negative one into one, negative one. And one into one, one. Negative one into one, negative one. One into one. One, one into negative, negative one, one. So what I am trying to suggest here is, first first element of the code sequence multiplied by the second element of the different code sequence, likewise, and then you add them. That is negative one into negative one plus negative one into negative one like this. So when you add this, it has to go to a zero. It will give you a zero. It has to give you a zero. That is even if you take B dot C, the inner product. It will give you zero. So all the chip sequences are pairwise orthogonal. And these codes are coming from Walsh code. These are the Walsh code to generate such orthogonal chip sequence. As I said, 64, 124 bit will be there. How do you represent the orthogonality? If you take these two, B and C, negative one into negative one plus negative one into one like this, last negative one into negative one. So you add them, that will give you zero. So this here is the expression. Then the normalized inner product of any chip sequence with itself will be one. But what about the station? Okay, if you take a dot a inner inner dot product, as I said, because each of the m terms in the inner product is one, so the sum will be m. That is what the station means. S dot s dash. That is, you take one and the negation of the other, it will give you this uh, scenario. Now, during each bit, a station can transmit a one. It can transmit a zero. One means it is sending its chip sequence, or zero that means it is sending the negative of its chip sequence, or even it can be silent. Any station can can be idle. So when two or more stations they are transmitting simultaneously, their bipolar sequence add linearly. That is, you will take the pairwise one by one dot product and just add them. For example. If one chip be read, three station output one. For example, A, B, C is set, are sending one. The D station is sending a negative one. Just add them. What do you get? You will get a plus two. This will be received. This will be sent to the channel. Just assume them as a signal that just they are just adding the voltages superimposed on the channel. So in terms of voltage, if three stations are sending plus one volt, one station is sending negative one volt. So it will be. Three minus one, which is two, so two volt will be received. Okay, it's all voltage. Nothing is there. All voltage. Now you see from S one to S six, six examples of one or more station. They are transmitting one bit at at the same time. So first example is S one equal to six. That is only C transmit a one bit. So we will just get the chip sequence of C. What is the chip sequence of C? Negative one, one, negative one, 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 negative one, negative one. In the second example, S two, both B and C are transmitting one. So what do we do? We will take the pairwise combination and addition of these one bit. How do we do? Negative one, negative one is the negative two. Negative one, one is zero. So whole like this. Last one is negative one, negative one. That will be negative two. You got the idea? How do we get negative one, negative one? You multiply and then write. 
and then add and then write. This, this is how. And finally, you have to write the sequence. In order to recover the bit stream, receiver must know the station chip sequence in advance. If A is sending something, the receiver of A need to know what is the actual sequence. So recovery is done by computing again the normalized inner product of the received chip sequence and the chip sequence of the station. That is the content in the channel multiplied by the chip sequence, the chip sequence of that particular station, and you have to divide because by the number of stations. Okay, I'll give you an example. For example, two station A and C. Now they are transmitting one bit at the same time. A is sending one, a C is sending one. And B is transmitting a zero. So what do you do? First, you have to take the sum of A, C, and since B is sending zero, you have to take the B complement. Okay, pairwise. So A and C chip sequence. B will be all negative uh, the negation complement. So what do you get? Then this whatever you get, you have to multiply it with the C. If C receiver wants to know, then you have to multiply whole with the C C C, okay, dot C. Suppose uh, that the receiver, as I said, wants to know what C has sent. So what we will do? We will use this addition and then just multiply it with the code sequence of C. For two to the power n station, Walsh code can provide two to the power n orthogonal chip sequence of length two to the power n. Now let me show you the exact example. We are taking an example of CDMA or code division multiple access. C is for chip pattern. Chip pattern means the unique code assigned to an individual station. Every station is assigned a unique chip sequence called as chip pattern. Two machines will not have same chip sequence. Wherever you see D, that will be data bits. So there are properties related with this chip pattern. Before that, when you are going to send zero, we will use negative one. When we will send one, we will use plus one. For example, there is a code. This code we have used four only for Simplicity, it can be 4, 16, 64, it can go above. So negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1 we have taken. So this is a chip pattern or chip sequence. When we are sending 1, we will send this. If you are sending 0, then the same machine will complement it. That is, it will make it as plus 1, and negative 1, negative 1 and plus 1. So complement will be sent. Okay. Now, we are ready for the actual example. Let us assume we have four stations. Station 1, Station 2, Station number 3, and Station number 4. As I said, every station will be assigned a code, and depending upon the code, they will send the data. They send the data on a single channel. That is why we are calling it as Code Division Multiple Access. So let us take the example. We are again taking only four of these. It can go beyond uh, 64, 20, 128. So say C1 is 1111, one, one, C2 is 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, C3 is 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, and C4, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. These are the chip pattern or the unique chip sequence of four machines or four stations. So what are the properties? The first property is that if any pair you take and you take the inner dot product, then you need to get a zero. That is, you just have to take the dot product of the pair. Okay, I'll give you an example. Let us take C1 and C4. Now C1 is 1111 one, 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 and C4 is 1 negative 1 negative 1 1. We are taking the code assigned to C1, C4, that is station 1 and station 4. Now what do you multiply this one with 1? What do you get? 1. Now multiply the second one. That is 1 into negative 1 is negative 1. Third one, 1 with negative 1 is negative 1. Fourth one, one with one is one. Now you add them. When you add, you will get a zero. You take any pair of these code, sequ uh, code sequence and you take an inner dot product. It should show the orthogonality pairwise.
The second important thing is if you multiply the code of a station with itself, it should get or you should get the number of stations. What does it mean? Let us take now C3. Now let us take the dot product of C3 and C3 in our dot product. So we have C3, the code is 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. Then we have again same thing, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. And now take 1 into 1 is 1, 1 into 1 is again 1, negative 1 into negative 1 is 1, negative 1 into negative 1 is negative 1, just add them. What do you get? 4. How many stations are there? 4. So now both the conditions are fulfilled. You can only give code when they fulfill this condition. Right? The, the necessary and sufficient condition is done. Now we have to send the data. Let us say station 1 is sending data as negative 1. As I said, D will represent data as bits. D2 is sending plus 1. D3 is sending negative 1 and D4 is sending 1. Now how do we send it? So when the state, because all of them are going to send together. So we have to multiply C1 with D1. So C1, the data has to multiply with the code, then only it will come to the channel. That is, we will multiply negative 1 with C1. We multiply negative 1 with every element, 4 element we have. Then we will multiply C2, D2, same thing, C3, D3 and C4, D4. And then we are going to add it and the resultant will go to the channel, to the transmission medium. So let me just uh, do it. C1, D1. What is C1? 1, 1, 1, 1. one. What is D1? Negative 1. So all will be negative. So it will be negative 1. I am multiplying each, each code with negative 1. So negative 1. Now C2, D2. Now 1 into 1 is 1. Negative 1 into 1 is... So same, same thing will come. Because multiplying with 1. Same thing will come. Now C3, D3. Now we are multiplying the C3 with uh, negative 1. So all will be inverted. You will get negative 1. Negative 1, 1 and 1. Now same thing with C4, D4. Now we are multiplying 1 with the code. So same thing will come. 1, negative 1, negative 1 and 1. Okay. Now we are done with this. Now you have to add it. So now add pairwise on 4 quad, quad wise. You add this. Negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, 0. Now negative 1, 4 times you get negative 4. Again, negative 1, 1, 1 and negative 1. It will be 0. Then fourth one. Negative 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1 and 1. Again, you will get a 0. So this is the final content that is going to go in the channel. 0, negative 4, 0 and 0. Okay. So this is going to go. Okay. Now the sending is done. What about retrieval? The retrieval, the receiver has to have the code already known to itself in advance. Okay. We will multiply the code with the channel data and we'll divide it with the number of station. You will get the bit what is being sent. Let us start. 0, negative 4, 0, 0 was there. Now let us say the receiver 1 wants what the station 1 has sent. So this receiver want to know what the station 1 has sent. What is in this code? So what we'll do? We will take the channel data 0, negative 4, 0, 0. And since the receiver already know the code of station 1, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, we have to take the inner product, dot product, what it will be? See, 1 by 1, 0 into 1, 0, negative 4 into 1, negative 4, 0 into 1, again 0, 0 into 1, 0. Now you have to add them, just add them. What do you get? Negative 4. Now what do you have to do? You have to divide it by the number of stations. There are 4. So divide by 4. What do you get? You get a negative 1. And this negative 1 was sent by the station 1. Okay? This you have to do for every station. This is how the code division multiple access work. This is an easy scenario, but in practice, it goes for a long code. Thank you so much. Wavelength division multiplexing. Wavelength is a property of a signal. Wave, any wave, any sine cosine type of wave, it will have a wavelength. That is, wavelength is a distance between the two crest or two trough. Okay. Now, a white light if you see and if you pass it through a prism, it will give you all the different colors, different wavelengths, different uh, wavelength. Okay. So, this WDM, Wavelength Division Multiplexing, is a form of FDM only, Frequency Division Multiplexing. It is an analog multiplexing technique 
where we combine the optical signals. So multiple beams of light at different frequency. We are talking about optical fiber. So this is a form of FDM only. Each color of light that is what we are calling as wavelength carries separate data channel. That is they will com be combined by the combiner and they will be split by a splitter. Commercial system have right now 160 channels, each channel giving up to 10 Gbps. So here you see four fiber come together at an optical combiner and each are combined lambda 1 to lambda 4. They are added and each with its energy present at a different wavelength. The four beams are combined on a single shared fiber for the transmission. This is a long haul shared fiber. What about the receiver end? Beam is split up over as many fibers. Many fibers. So these are different fibers where different wavelengths has, has been sent. So each output fiber, specially constructed core is there that fil filter out uh, the only one wavelength, all but one wavelength. So this is uh, similar to frequency division. WDM is referring to fiber optic channels by their wavelength or you can call it as a color rather than frequency. So optical system, they use diffraction grating and as I said, they are quite uh, uh, reliable because they are completely passive. When we were discussing fiber optics, I told you these are the bands we are taking since the bandwidth of a single fiber band is 25,000 gigahertz. This is theoretically, there is already theoretically room for 2510 Gbps channel even at 1 bit per hertz. So wavelength division multiplexing WDM, this technology is advancing more than computer technology because WDM was invented around 1990. First commercial system, it had 8 channels, every channel giving 2.5 Gbps speed. 1998, there were systems with 40 channels, each channel providing 2.5 Gbps. 2006, product with 192 channels of 10 Gbps and 64 channels of 40 Gbps and they are giving speed up to 2.56 terabit per second. Coming to 2019, 160 channels, 16 terabit per second over a single fiber pair. And this is 800 times the systems that were there in 1990. So what we are trying to suggest here is narrowing the spacing to 12.5 gigahertz, make it possible to support even one three, uh, 320 channels on a single fiber. The system with these large number of channels, a little spacing between each channel are DWDM or dense WDM or dense wave division multiplexing. I hope you got the idea of Dense WDM. In WDM, uh, we have to have a conversion because some amplica amplification has to be done. So we need some uh, electro optical amplifiers, you can say. But now, today, all are optical, that is, all optical amplifiers, they can regenerate the entire signal or once every 1000 kilometers without the need for multiple amplification previously that, that were there and what were there because there were opto electrical conversions need to be done but now it is not required we have all optical amplifiers so we have fixed wavelength system for example in this figure if you say bit from input fiber 1 they are, it is going to output fiber 3 and the bits from input fiber 2 go to output fiber 1. Fiber different spectrums are there when they are combined these are the spectrum on the shared, shared fiber. Now there has to have some you know wavelength the wavelength tuning has to be done. So in order to bind the WDM wavelength division multiplexing that are switched in the optical domain output filters are tunable using the Fabry parrot and MAC Zender interferometer. These devices, they allow selected frequencies to be changed dynamically just by a control computer. So many different wavelengths path through the telephone network from a fixed set of fibers thanks to WDM wavelength division multiplexing. Communication satellites.
Now communication means sending, receiving of information, data. Satellite is that instrument, that object in the celestial sky and behaving as if it is like moon following all the laws. So how it started in 1950s and early 1960s, there were people who actually at that time there were metallized weather balloons already there. So people tried to use this metallized weather balloon in order to communicate. That is, they wanted to set up a communication system by bouncing signals of these metallized weather balloons. Uh, you know, this was a very good try and inventive thought. But unfortunately, the received signals were so weak that the communication for that communication cannot be set up. The communication system cannot be set up because the, the received signal was very weak. Now you see here moon. Now comes the US Navy. US Navy built an operational system, a proper operational communication system between ships in the water and the shore, that is the land. So, they built an operational system for ship to shore communication by a bouncing of the signal from where? From the moon, the, the natural satellite. So, what is the difference between a, a, an artificial satellite and a real satellite? The difference is the artificial satellite. Artificial satellite means the satellite which we will send and it will behave like moon. That is, it will set up and it will go around and round earth following all the, as I say, the laws, gravitational law and etc. So the artificial satellite, they can amplify the signals before sending back because moon doesn't know what we are sending. So it will just strike, the signal will strike, it will bounce off and whatever you will get, you will get. That is the signal will be, let's uh, say, bounced off from these uh, actual, actual satellites like moon. But as I'm suggesting, the artificial satellite, we because we are making it, so we can make the provision that the signals which are being, being sent back, because uplink is sending from ground to satellite, downlink is from satellite to the ground station. Okay, So we can put the some digital signal processing and amplification so that what we get is usable. So communication satellite, you can imagine this as a big, very big microwave repeater, not on the ground, but in the sky. So you know that we have, we have been using the microwave links and we put 50-50 kilometers repeater in order to enhance the signal strength. And the same thing is happening in the sky. So you can imagine communication satellite as a big microwave repeater in the sky. In this satellites, there are certain uh, transponders. For example, some spectrum is being given to you as a satellite uh, manufacturer or user. Now the transponder, each transponder will listen to some portion of the spectrum. Today we have around 40 transponder in the present satellites, maybe more than that. So the main idea is to amplify the incoming signal. That is the, when the uplink, that is from ground station to the satellite, the signal goes, it is being amplified, the energy is uh, reboosted and then it is rebroadcasted. Please remember, satellite is broadcasting. So it is rebroadcasting, it adds some another frequency to avoid interference with incoming signal. Why I am saying that the frequency is different? Because the incoming signal is at certain frequency, the, the downlink has to be in another frequency, otherwise there will be some interference. Okay. Now this is the uh, picture of a ground station doing uplink and uh, downlink and the mode of operation is known as a bent pipe. What all I explained you, this is called the bent pipe. Now what you can do here is, what, what people have done is, the digital signal processing or digital processing can be added here because this can be added on board. Whatever uh, 
data stream is coming or the signal is coming so we will we may be able to manipulate clean change or make it better for the downlink in the overall band this can be done so there are various uh, ways because you know in digital signal processing we have various fourier transforms we have the image cleaning data cleaning data amplification morphing what not so all these digital processing can be done on board so that you get a proper in on the ground or the this digital information this can also be received and this can be rebroadcasted by the satellite now if when you are regenerating the signal it will improve the performance because in bent pipe whatever is being sent is being received though there is some amplification but regenerating the signals using the digital signal processing it is better than the bent pipe as satellite does not amplify noise in the upward signal because noise will always there if you send something to the to the uh, to any any you know sender receiver then you will have noise you cannot get rid of that cleaning the noise and then amplifying will give you a clean data and the signal so the downward beams can be broad and it can cover a substantial fraction of the earth surface what does it mean see this is a satellite now or you can imagine that you are standing there how much you can view the field of view will be higher as the altitude increases from the surface of ground so you can also have the narrow a very narrow kind of uh, you can say footprint covering an area only hundreds of kilometer so this is this depends on what how how you the manufacturer have made it satellites in communication satellite or all the satellites the kepler law uh, as i said they are applicable first kepler law is the orbits are ellipse because it's all gravitation happening and the orbits will follow a egg shaped uh, structure not a circular so orbits will remain as ellipse this is the first kepler law elliptical it will be elliptical the second kepler uh, law is equal areas in equal time for example in the same time two areas are covered or two length are covered if you join this center and join this center this area shaded area will remain equal that is this kepler second law and the third is the time period is directly proportional to the radius what power power to the 3 to 3 to uh, 3 by 2 that is let me just make it like this uh, t square is a cube that is let us write a as the radius so t square is directly proportional to r cube now let us multiply both sides by 1 by 2 what do you get the time period is directly proportional to the 3 by 2 power of radius that is r to the power 1.5 so the orbital period of satellite varies as as the radius of orbit to the uh, power 3 by 2 these are kepler law so uh, the kepler law is applicable to every satellite because it is following the rules and law because it is in the sky you have established it in the sky so higher the satellite longer will be the period and it is this is quite common sense and this is very logical also if the if the earth is there and wh what is the period that is when it is uh, rotating or you can say completing the whole circle or ellipse that time the low orbit satellite that will pass out very fairly quickly why because it is at a smaller distance it is called the lower or you can say leo orbit the geo orbit is quite far 36000 km a geo 24 hours it takes to make a complete complete or time period for orbit and the same time the earth also revolves around its axis that is the geo stationary will remain as it is so many of them are needed to provide this uh, low I'm, i'm talking about leo leo we need more of them because we want the continuous coverage and there has to be some ground antennas that must track them so geo stationary is like uh, you are standing and you are viewing a large area the low earth uh, satellite they are viewing a lesser area for that you need more of them let me give you numbers now this is 36000 to remember but to be precise it is 35786 So thirty five thousand eight hundred here, but the exact number is thirty five thousand seven hundred eighty six. This is the period. The period is twenty four hours. That is, in order to orbit, means complete its orbit, it will take twenty four hours if it is at a distance of thirty six thousand kilometer from the Earth's surface. 
okay that is called the geostationary satellite or geosynchronous satellite because it is moving in at the same time it is taking same time as the earth is revolving uh, around its, its axis now take the distance as 384000 the period is what one month you know about moon moon does that so as the distance increases the orbital period also increases at 384000 it will be one month as the moon is doing because moon is also a satellite though it is not an artificial satellite it does like that the one important factor here to understand is the van allen belts because satellite period is one of the consideration there is one more consideration or another issue is the presence of this van allen belts what are the what are these van allen belts how do you how, how do you know that this uh, this moon is revolving around earth because of the magnetic field okay now earth has magnetism so there are layers of highly charged particles which are trapped by the earth magnetic field and these field are nothing but the van allen belts these are called as van allen belts let me just show you uh, the the places because the these van allen belts if the, if you are sending the satellite or trying to establish it will be destroyed in particles so these fac factors we only have three regions in which the satellites can be placed safely leo meo and geo okay now the people will ask what about these places why are you we are not putting in between the answer is van allen belts because here the satellite will be destroyed in pieces in particles so let me show you here the red and the yellow part this is the van allen element this is the inner belt around 1000 to 800 miles 8000 miles and uh, you cannot have satellite here so it can be earth be between earth and the first belt or it can be between the first belt and second belt the second belt outer belt which is 12000 to 25000 miles you cannot have any satellite here so in between earth and the first inner belt or between the first inner belt and the second inner belt and after the second inner belt these are the only three possibility so which is near to the earth is leo between the first inner belt and the and the second inner belt this is the meo gps satellites are here and finally outer that is the outer those satellites which are outer of the outer belt which are placed here are called the geosynchronous or geostationary satellites geo this is called the geo orbit okay so this van allen belt is a criteria you cannot have satellites here geostationary satellites geosynchronous satellite we are discussing geostationary satellite but before that you need to understand geosynchronous also geostationary is that those satellites which are at 36000 km and they are orbiting in the equatorial plane of the earth that satellite which you established at 36000 km and a person will see always see that satellite because it is it will seem to be stationary because earth will go around its axis complete its one day in 24 hours complete a uh, revolution and uh, this is uh, rotation sorry rotation and the satellite will also take the same time at 36000 km so that is the stationary geo uh, skin synchronous you can say it has some angle from the equatorial plane it is not at the equatorial plane there will be an angle of inclination so this is more polar this is more uh, inclined polar because the geostationary will not cover the polar areas if you want to cover the polar areas this geostationary has to be geosynchronous geosynchronous so this question is asked normally what is geostationary what is geosynchronous let us come back to geostationary satellite now here is arthur c clarke in 1945 he is not a scientist he is not any you know uh, a nasa person now you have to salute this guy why because he was just a writer he was a science fiction writer arthur c clarke what he done and why i am praising him because in his books in his fiction stories he calculated in the science fiction that a satellite at an altitude of 35800 km in a circular equatorial orbit would remain or would appear to remain motionless in the sky did i just tell you i told you because we have science the technology has advanced 
but in 1945 mr clark has already written as a fiction that at this particular distance he gave the exact number also at this distance there will be satellite and this will remain motionless in the sky because the time earth takes to complete its one rotation the satellite will also take the same time to complete its orbit so he described he completely described the communication system that you that uh, use this he said that that will be manned geostationary satellite he told about he wrote about the orbits he wrote about the solar panels he wrote about the radio frequencies even the launch procedures and he is just or he was just a writer he was not a scientist he was not from from some space uh, research organization unfortunately what he said was that uh, there will be walls you know at that time so he said uh, it, it will be impractical the uh, the satellites won't be able to work it is impractical so he gave all the idea all the science all the theories all the numbers and because he was writing he said it will be it will not be possible because at that time the transistors were not there but after him the invention of transistor they changed everything because his idea was how to give the power how to keep rotating how to keep uh, all those uh, fun- the technology and machinery working so the invention of transistor changed everything and now you have to remember 10 july 1962 this was the day in aviation that changed history and this is not about changing uh, the history of aviation this was the first artificial communication satellite called telstar and this was launched in july 1962 10th july 1962 so these high flying satellites at 36000 km seem to be stationary are called geo or geostationary earth orbit satellites okay so we call we'll call it them as geo g e o geo so uh, just uh, i'll give you an example because it is an equatorial plane so assume it to be 360 degree where the geostationary satellites can be placed because this is a very precise orbit so it is technologically unwise to have this geo space much closer than 2 degree in the 360 degree equatorial plane because there will be interference we need to have at least 2 degree of difference so with the spacing of 2 degree what will happen only 180 satellites 180 geostationary satellite can be placed but there are people china also wants to do it there japan also wants to do it even in india so in order to prevent the chaos in the sky the orbit slot allocation uh, was done or is done by itu itu is international telecommunication union so they said okay i we will tell you how, what uh, you know uh, the allocation we can do for you so modern satellites if you see they are very large huge weighing over 5000 kg 5000 kg they have uh, solar panels so they are consuming several kilowatts of electric power which are produced by the on board solar panels but because they are in the sky they are not in that much control of uh, the ground station sometimes there will be effect of uh, solar lunar and uh, planetary gravity because if you leave your kid outside to the hostel it may happen that he may just lose his way so same thing the effect of the solar lunar and the uh, planetary gravity it move them the satellites from their assigned uh, orbit slots which has been already assigned by uh, agencies and orientation can also be drifted so this is an effect which is which has to be countered and this is countered by the on board rocket motors there are on board rocket motors that will always make arrangements so that the satellite can be in on its course on its slot orientation so this fine tuning activity is called as station keeping this is called as station keeping and what happens after the life is done in around 10 years when the fuel for motor it will exhaust the satellite will it will behave like you know uh, independent so the satellite will drift it will tumble so the ground connection has to be turned off so it needs to be turned off after certain years so what will happen to the satellite will it be a space waste but it will not be because what happens here is is 
uh, this happens, it will die down, it will burn off. Okay, so eventually the orbit decays and the satellite re-enters into the atmosphere and it will eventually burn up like what you see in this uh, picture. Okay, you have seen the meteors when they come, most of the meteors, 99% of the meteors, they just burn up, same way. Along with these orbit slots which we discussed at, at length, frequency is also an issue. Whenever we are dealing with any satellite, the frequency, because because you know the downlink transmission, it will interfere with the existing microwave users. There is already microwave terrestrial links which are being established by various countries, various agencies. Now the downlink transmission, if they are having the same frequency, they are going to interfere uh, interfere with the uh, the existing microwave users. Okay, for that an agency has to come. So ITU has allocated certain frequency bands to the satellite users also. That this is the these are the frequency. Uh, you can use because it should not be interfering with the microwave users. So how it started in the earlier time when it started the C-band was the first to be made available for the commercial satellite traffic when actually satellite traffic were commercialized. So C-band was the first. C-band uh, the downlink was 4 gigahertz and the uplink is 6 gigahertz. Please remember the downlink is always lesser than the uplink. Now you have to give me an answer for that. Why? So, uplink is from ground station to satellite, what you said, and the downlink is what you get from satellite to the ground station. These are the signals, the signals I am talking about. So, two frequency ranges, lower one for uh, the downlink traffic and upper one for the uplink traffic. After that, the L and S bands were added in the year 2000. So, this L and S, uh, S band, then came the KU, KU, KU is Q band, U is for K under band. And uh, it is not uh, that much con congested as of now and because it has higher frequency. L and S band were having 1.5 gigahertz, 1.6 gigahertz. S was 1.9 and 2.2 gigahertz uh, downlink uplink. And when it comes to KU, it's 11 gigahertz uh, downlink, 14 gigahertz uplink. So this, is, as I'm saying that it is not that much con congested because the frequency as you see, it is higher. The bandwidth is also around 500 megahertz. Satellites can be placed as close as 1 degree and transmission speeds up to 500 Mbps. The pr problem here in Q band and K band is rain. Even in the you know lower part of uh, atmosphere, stratosphere etc. or troposphere etc. we have water or the you know, humidification is there. So the water absorbs these short microwaves. Then the Ka band, K above band for commercial satellite traffic. The problem is everything is good but the equipments are quite expensive. Rain is affecting Q band and K band both, but the equipment costs are also there. In K, it's quite expen expensive because the downlink is 20 gigahertz and the uplink is 30 gigahertz and the bandwidth is 3500 megahertz as given by the ITU. These are the ranges. So now coming to the transponder part of the of the satellites, modern satellite they will have. 40 transponders and more and every transponder as I said the spectrum will be there so every transponder will listen at particular uh, say a part of that spectrum around 36 megahertz bandwidth for each trans uh, transponder and then th this is the picture of the actual transponder and each transponder beam is divided into time slots so it will use the time division multiplexing that will it will get the whole uh, a particular time to send and receive. The first geo satellite or geo, uh, they it had a spatial beam. Spatial is the distance. Spatial beam that emulated about uh, one third of the Earth's surface, around forty-two point two percent to be precise. This is called a footprint. Let me just show you here. See, if you are say imagine yourself here, how much Earth you can see? It's it's your eye. Satellite is nothing but eye. When this, it's, you can have an analogy of the eye. So the, the field of view will be larger. In Leo, the lower one, the area will be lesser. So the footprint can be one third of the earth. Nowadays, now each downward beam, this can be focused on a small geographical area. If you are from United States, why do you want to cover whole earth? You will concentrate on United States. So you, the multi, so multiple upward and downward transmission can take place simultaneously. So this small area or the field of view 
or the beam area these are the uh, spot beams they are elliptically shaped like an egg and they can be as small as few hundred kilometer in diameter now this picture you see here is of vsat vsat in geostationary satellite you need to have a ground station or the antenna has to be large it has to be expensive it has to be bulky so you know even uh, a order of a uh, maybe two or three playground so then came the vsats low cost micro stations these are called very small aperture terminals now this v s a t v sat the antenna parabola shaped antenna the size was uh, there are tiny tiny terminals if you compare to the geo antenna uh, that is that is geo stationary earth orbit antenna 10 10 meters and above these are tiny terminals have they have a 1 meter and even smaller than that so it is smaller quite means quite smaller than 1 meter it can be handled quite easily and they can put out power about 1 watt so the power is also less an uplink up to 1 mbps and downlink also certain several megabits per second so direct broadcast satellite television they use this vsat for a one way transmission so vsat will also a revolution because now we can use this to do certain various activity the ground station we call it as a hub so you see here i'm showing you the vsat let me show you here we have the high gain antennas here so this is a hub we said and how is the transmission taking place this is a communication satellite so from hub to satellite to the smaller vsats and from the vsat to the satellite to the hub so there has to be a hub a big hub station so here you have a hub station a satellite and you see even the internet and the file download all can be done using this very small aperture terminal vsat this is how the technology has advanced high gain antenna is needed to relay the traffic between the different vsats in this uh, geostationary satellites communication satellites if you want to know the difference between the communication satellites in the terrestrial point to point links because you see these are antennas and these are line of sight point of point to point uh, links so there are certain differences there are advantages and there's disadvantages now if you uh, know the speed of light it is 3 into 10 to the power this this is huge 3 into 10 to the power 6 meter per second okay 3 to 10 to the power 8 8 8 so that is 300 000 km okay this is not 3 into 10 to the power 6 it is 3 into 10 to the power 8 now even though the signal to and from uh, satellite uh, travel at the speed of this light there is a long round trip and this will introduce latency that is a substantial delay for the geostationary satellite so a typical round trip value will be 270 millisecond if you are using a vsat system with a hub it will be 540 millisecond the terrestrial microwave links they have a propagation delay of 3 microsecond per kilometer so the delay in the terrestrial microwave link will be 3 microsecond per kilometer but if you talk about coaxial cable and the fiber optic links what will be the delay the delay will be 5 microsecond per kilometer so you can see the difference micro is smaller milli is higher so the delay will be higher in geostationary satellite okay satellites i'm talking about the security aspect now so the satellites are inherently broadcast media that is it will send to everyone everyone can listen everyone can understand everyone can do whatever they want so from the privacy point of view the satellites they are disaster because everybody can hear everything it is broadcasting so in order to keep the confidentiality privacy point of view encryption is essential encryption means you know sending the data as if it is being changed for example if you want to send x y you can send a b and in the you know retrieval that is the decryption point you can again change it to x y so satellite costs of transmitting a message it is not dependent on the distance traversed it is same wherever you send if you do a large beam small broad beam near far wherever you want to send satellite cost of transmitting any signal or message is independent of the distance traveled satellite they also have excellent air error rates that is their error rates are less and they can be deployed almost instantly most of the time the government agency does that 
because if some disaster is there and the government has to respond or the military communication has to take place the satellites are the best option but there are disadvantages also first of all launching satellite is itself a very big task and it is costly also we have elon musk jeff bezos and ambani they can do that now but the it is quite costly and satellite bandwidth is gradually becoming used up so from where the bandwidth will come this is another uh, problem you cannot say disadvantage but this is the thought what you have to think as the upcoming technocrats and there is a larger uh, propagation delay or the latency in satellite communication than if you compare it with the terrestrial communication so there are certain things you have to keep in your mind this is your satellite based communication this is your terrestrial wireless communication so you have on the ground you can have a point to point communication in satellite it is all about sending the data or signal to your satellite it will amplify do some digital signal processing and send it back through downlink to the ground station so in satellite based communication and terrestrial wireless communication in the satellite based communication the area of coverage is higher because if you see a, a satellite it can cover a larger area around 42.2% geo will cover geo satellites so in terrestrial wireless communication the area of coverage is not comparable with the satellite based the satellite based communication this uses limited resources of spacecraft power and allocated bandwidth because the itu has provided the bandwidth and this, there is a limited power but in terrestrial wireless communication this uses unlimited resource in the earth station and satellite okay now the one more thing is the in the satellite the time is invariant between the communicating satellites what does it mean in terrestrial wireless communication there is no time variation between the two terrestrial wireless antennas the precision in satellite is achieved accurately between the satellite communication and uh, when you talk about the terrestrial wireless communication there is less precision between the terrestrial antenna in the satellite the quality of the transmission is extremely high because the satellite links are used in short term basis in terrestrial the quality of transmission is low because the satellite links are used in long term in the satellite very high bandwidths are available to the users and in the terrestrial bandwidths of data and the data rates are moderately available to the user as compared to the satellite based communication so satellite the delay time is higher terrestrial it is less satellite broadcast to everyone microwave or the terrestrial link they don't do it covid confidentiality is is secure mio or medium earth orbit satellites so this is leo here we have geo in between this is the medium earth orbit we have known about the van allen belts so it leaves us only to these region so the intermediate between leo and geo is mio the region between leo and geo stationary orbit the altitude is from 2000 to 36000 km the orbital period that is to cover all the you know uh, orbit is 2 to 24 hours larger coverage area than the leo and very good for the communications but the disadvantage is the high levels of space radiation in this range or this uh, altitude the global positioning system different gpss they have satellite here so mio medium earth orbit satellites between the two van allen belts that we have discussed where the part the satellite will actually burn uh, this mio take around 6 hours to circle the earth since it is higher than leo and lower than geo they have smaller full footprint on the ground and they require less powerful transmitters to reach them footprint is the area it can see the area it can communicate okay so it has a smaller footprint than geo though higher than the leo and this uh, range uh, meo is used for navigation systems rather than the telecommunications and in this area as i said whichever gps you know for example the navstar or the american gps they have 24 satellite every time they are active so you get three satellite you get the exact position of yourself so there are 30 gps 
there are around 20,200 kilometers from the Earth's surface. These are MEO satellites. LEO or LEO satellites. LEO. The name itself suggests that they are the nearest to the Earth's surface. The distance or the altitude from the Earth's surface is 375 to 1000 miles. That is the orbital range is from 500 to 1500 kilometer above the Earth's surface. So this is the nearest to the Earth's surface. The revolution time is around 90 minutes to 3 hours. And most important thing is these LEO satellites, they don't stay in fixed position related to the surface if you are standing. They are only visible for 15 to 20 minutes each pass. So there are certain advantages also. That is the transmission delay is very less as compared to the GEO and MEO. And uh, it will not need bulky receiving equipment as was in GEO. The disadvantage is it has smaller, smaller coverage area. What, why it is smaller coverage? Because it is quite closer to the earth. So the, you can say the field of view is also less. The GEO has around lifespan of 10 years, the satellites. This uh, LEO has around 5 to 8 years. So we have a subdivision here, little, big and mega LEOs. And since uh, it's quite closer to the earth, so a network of LEO satellite is necessary for LEO satellites to be useful actually. The LEO is low earth orbit satellite. We need large numbers of these satellites in order to complete a full constellation for a complete system. And since they are very near ground station, do not need much power. As compared to the MEO and uh, GEO, the round tip delay is also less, that is around 40 to 150 milliseconds. This is the round trip, you can also call it as the latency. That is the time signal is sent and it is received. This is around 40 to 150 milliseconds. While if you talk about the GEO, if you use VSAT, it's around more than 50, uh, 500 sorry, 500. So whenever we talk about the communication, we have two, uh, the constellation or the project. First is the Iridium and the second is the Global Star, Global Star and Iridium. So they are very popular and they give a lot of services right from voice to paging, fax, uh, the location, etc. Iridium is a low earth ob orbit satellite constellation. So this Iridium, actually what happened? In 1990, Motorola came up with an idea and they filed the application with the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission of United States. And they asked for the permission to launch 77 LEO low orbit satellite for this Iridium project because the 77 element is Iridium and this was the first time something this something of this sort has happened. So it was later revised to 66 satellite and the project was renamed as Dysprosium. The element is 66 but still we know it by Iridium. Now this idea was like this because this idea was very became very popular and buzz in this, in this uh, satellite industry. So the idea was that uh, because it is LEO, LEO you know LEO remains uh, in view for 15 to 20 minutes, not more than that. So if one satellite went out of the view, the another should replace it. This was the idea. After all the you know formality, the service began in November 1998. But the problem was, it was very unfortunate that in the 90, from the 1990s, the mobile phone network has already grown exponentially. So the commercial demand for large and heavy satellite phones were uh, very less or you can say very negligible and it was very unfortunate for this Iridium project. Commercially, it was not so profitable, it was not profitable and was forced to file a bankruptcy in August 1999, this Iridium. Okay. But, uh, you know, before they can sell, they are selling it actually, satellites and other assets, it was uh, worth uh, 5 billion and it was purchased by an investor for just 25 million. But, you know, if you do something with whole heart and something is promising, 
it pays later so iridium it restarted in march 2001 and since then it is topping that means it is providing voice data paging fax navigation service everywhere anywhere on a land on air on sea via the satellite handheld devices that can communicate directly with the constellation that is the iridium satellite this is one of the iridium satellite we are witnessing so customer include wide variety it is maritime the aviation the oil exploration industries and even the individuals who want some navigation or connectivity when they are at a place where is there is no connectivity this is the iridium project so in this iridium satellites these are from above earth above surface they are 670 kilometers and they are in the circular polar orbit please understand they cover the polar because the global master it doesn't cover the the polar so they have the circular or polar orbits and one satellite is there every 32 degree of latitude every 32 degree there is one satellite e satellite has a maximum of 48 cells that is the for the spot beams and has a capacity of 3840 3840 channels so these channels some of them are used for paging and navigation and some of them are used for data and voice so you know you have seen the necklace the normally the the women wear it so this necklace they have pearls also so you can imagine the constellation as different necklaces with these pearls as the satellite so communication between customer they, they take place only in space for example a north person north pole person is calling it is going to call the satellite directly over it this satellite has four neighbors as you see here the 1 2 3 4 which it can communicate two from the same necklace and two from the adjacent necklaces necklaces means the the idi i showed you so the satellite relay the call across these grid until it finally is received or sent down to the callee at the south pole so the communication happens on the space takes place in space global must global star or low earth orbit satellite so this global star the constellation of satellites are in leo orbit the global star is a low earth leo satellite constellation for satellite phone and low speed data communication the global star orbits have an inclination of 52 degrees that is they are not covering that much of the polar area because on the left hand side you see this is the figure of iridium it covers the polar area quite uh, nicely so the global star orbits have an orbital height of approximately 1400 km so we have 48 leo satellites in global star and global star uses a traditional bent pipe decision or uh, design of communication if someone is calling from the north pole it is sent back to the earth because it is the you know iridium all the communication take place at space here the call originating from say the north pole is sent back to the earth and then picked up by the large ground station and call is routed now via a terrestrial network on the ground to the ground station which is nearest to the callee that is who is supposed to receive the call and it is delivered by the bent pipe the advantage is that in iridium all things are happening on space so if something something has, has to be maintained you have to go to the satellite and it is that is not so easy in the global star it put much of the complexity on the ground so it is easier to manage okay you talk about electric electronic or electromechanical devices so use of a large ground station antenna that can put up or put out a powerful signal and they can also receive a weak one means that the low powered telephones can be used the the actual handheld devices are not uh, having that much of power what happens the academic uh, researchers from california polytechnic university and 
Stanford, this is I'm talking about United States, they got together in 1999 and they defined a standard for the miniature satellite. We are talking about 5000 kg satellite. But here they decided that we'll have a miniature kind of satellite. And that was called, I'll just show you that this is a size of a cube. This C is like a cube. So they were called as cube sats. Cube sats, that's for satellite. And these are satellites in units 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. If you type cube sats right now, you'll see Canada is leading now. So this is a very small size. You see the, the weight is just over 1 kg. The size is only or the volume is 10 centimeter cube. The size, the, the weight is not more than 1 kg, around 1 and 1, 1.25 kg. And the price for this, this one is $40,000, $40,000. And it can communicate with ground station on the UHF and VHF band. So these satellites are put as a payload to different big satellites which are being launched and they act as a payload and they just work the similar way the other satellite would work. Okay. UHF and VHF band. Now one more thing you need to know at the low earth orbit is one web. Boeing and various other you know they have started it. So another deployment of this LEO satellite is an attempted satellite based internet backbone network. Internet backbone network. This is a very very challenging and you know you can say encouraging kind of a project one web. So the constellation has innovative beam technology. They have small inexpensive satellites using existing technology. Around 900 satellites are to be produced for one web. And at ground we have affordable compact multi-user access terminals easily installable without uh, the position aiming and we ha will have gateways across the globe for this one web. One web, if it is successful, it promises to bring high speed internet access to every place, every place, especially to the developing country. Satellite will operate in K upper or Q band and will use a technique called the progressive pitch. What does it mean? Here the satellites are turned slightly to avoid interference with the geostationary satellites that are transmitting in the same band. So this will be the progressive pitch. One web, the backbone, internet backbone network satellite based at LEO. LEO, MEO, GEO. So low earth orbit, medium earth orbit and geostationary earth orbit. What are the differences? First we'll start with the LEO. So LEO satellites they are at the altitude of 160 km to 2000 km. Full orbital period, that is the time it completes full orbit, is around 82 to 88 to 127 minutes. The latency, that is the signal when sent and received, the round trip is approximately 2 milliseconds to 27 milliseconds. Now coming to the medium, medium earth orbit, MEO. These are at the altitude of 2000 km to 35,786, that is 36,000 km. Full orbit period is around 127 minutes to 24 hours. Latency is 27 milliseconds to 477 milliseconds. Coming to geostationary. Geosatellites, they are at the altitude of 35,786 km to just remember you can say 36,000 km. The orbital period is 24 hours. That is, it will be seen stationary. That is the same time the R3 was. Latency, the round trip is approximately 477 milliseconds for geostationary Earth orbit. So what we have discussed, the satellite height, LEO 500 to 1500, MEO 5000 to 12000, GEO 36000. The orbital period we saw and we can have a good idea about LEO 10 to 40 minutes, MEO is around 8 to 20, this is 2 to 8 hours, GEO is around 24 hours. The number of satellites in LEO requires higher 40 to 60, in Iridium it is 66, at 8 to 20 in MEO and in GEO because it covers almost you know, 42.2 or 43%, we have, we need 3 geo to cover whole earth. The satellite life of LEO is short around 5 years, geo is around 10 years, MEO is in between that. And there are two electron, electronic uh, aspect, communication aspect, number of hand, handoff and propagation loss also. The gateway cost in geo is cheap, it LEO it is quite expensive, very expensive. Now let me tell you about the merits and the demerits. In the LEO, 
the merit is the cost for launching is lower than the other two and since it is very close to earth very short round trip delays or or latency is there and since uh, the path loss is quite less than the other two mio and jio when it comes to mio the merits are the launch cost is between leo and jio that is moderate and the round trip are quite uh, smaller than jio as i said jio it is covering around 43% 42.2% of the earth surface so you need less satellites for that we have constant view because it is already 24 hours uh, the earth time and it it the, its own time no problem due to the doppler coming to the demerits leo has a short life 5 years and because the the distance at which it is placed the leo satellites they encounters radiation belts as it has a short los not uh, the line of sight and the the loss also the loss is also there then uh, in comes to mio the demerit said the round trip delays and it has the greater path loss as compared to the leo okay communication you are doing so there will be a path loss then coming to the geo the larger round trip delays as you see 477 uh, millisecond and we need expensive equi equipment due to weak signal okay this is all about uh, this topic thank you so much take care of yourself